Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by GoToWebinar, a trusted webinar platform with over 55,000 customers who've hosted over 2.7 million interactive web events to connect with their audiences. For more, visit GoToWebinar.com slash podcast. And by Eero, never think about Wi-Fi again with Eero's hyper-fast, super simple Wi-Fi system. And now the second generation Eero is tri-band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada, visit Eero.com, select overnight shipping at checkout, and enter the code NSS. Everybody, welcome to a very special new screensavers. This is our best of 2017 episode. Uh, for it's 137 recorded for today, Saturday, December 30th, 2017. Happy New Year! The new screensavers is our tech variety show, and man, when we say variety, we mean it. We this year we took you to Jupiter, we took you to the Sun and the rainforest. We explained machine learning. We covered innovations in virtual reality, AR, AI. We saw how tech can help food production. We visited the world-famous Lagunitas Brewery. That wasn't a big trip. It was just around the corner. We covered the maker scene. We talked about emoji. We had some fun with the game of geeks. We also unboxed and reviewed the top gear of the year from the iPhone 8 to the iPhone 10 and everything in between. All the Pixel products, laptops, mesh routers. We did a lot of that. Cameras. Let's jump right in. We're going to start with three games you particularly liked. We took votes and uh, we people were interested in the indie game Starship Horizons. This was very cool. A VR game, keep talking and no one explodes except we kept exploding. And a really fun game of Geeks Watch. <laughs> All right, our tour of duty is about to begin aboard the ASC Horizons. Your first order of business is to depart the stay stock. Once you clear, you will receive your next orders. Okay, from Alliance Command. Yeah. All right, bridge crew, report in. Starting with engineer. Engineer standing by, all systems at 100%. Light standing by. Uh, tactical, uh, roger. Science. Uh, comms, communicate to space dock that we are ready for departure. Requesting permission to depart. Horizons, you are go for a departure. Mr. Delahanty, take us out. What speed? Uh, regular speed. <laughs> Ahead full, sir. <laughs> you are all clear, Horizons. Okay. Good luck. What's the NSS Laporte? <laughs> Hailing yeah. NSS Laporte. Can you scan that, Megan? I text heavy, hev heavy shuttle is a medium range shuttle, slow and not very maneuverable, but well armored. That sounds about right. <laughs> That's a Laporte class for sure. Ah, uh, yes. Message from Starbase Alpha. Uh, we need you to inspect the two comm stations in orbit around the planets in the Viridian star system. Mr. Delahanty, uh, navigate to our first waypoint. Setting course to Viridian 1. Engage. <laughs> we are now going ludicrous speed. A message from comm station that they are under attack. Please assist. All right, setting status to oh, red alert. God. Prepare yourself. Okay, lasers are off, but I can arm them. I can arm. raise shields too, if you'd like. Raise shields and arm. Raising shields, it's a button Boop. pressed. Arm lasers, on. All right, make our way uh, full to that location. Setting intercept course. I've scanned the Dart A1A. What's the report? Uh, 45.58 kilograms of steel, 11.4 kilograms carbon fibers, one life form. Uh, we're, we're under attack, everyone. Do I fire? Do I fire? Fire at will. Okay. I will aim and I will fire. Oh, yeah. Target destroyed? Mm. Well, good work, uh, everyone. We survived our first battle. Captain, I believe this means that our shields are slightly down. Uh? Uh, yeah. What are those red marks? 
Red marks are uh, possibly some damage. Let me investigate this. All right. Any other vessels detected in the system? No. All right. Mr. Delahanty, there's, I believe, another planet in this system. Viridian 2 is the next possible destination. Set a waypoint and engage when ready. Engaging. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that was quick. Wow. It's very close. Ion reactor is damaged. Uh, Bravo team is repairing currently. Alpha, Charlie, and Delta are en route. Good. All right. Anything on the radar? A lot. Uh, less, yes. Whoa. Uh-oh. <laughs> Give me a full scan, science officer. Uh, shuttle Epsilon, Viridian 2-4, Viridian 2-10, Viridian 2-14, Viridian 11-20, 11-19. We're dead. Those are all shuttles? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Looks like we have one enemy target on the screen. Navigate for intercept course. Should I hail them? You can try comms, but if I know these bastards, they won't respond. <laughs> Space pirates, Captain. The worst yes, kind of pirates. pirates. <laughs> Tactical, I want you to shoot when ready. They said enjoy the vacuum of space. 57 kilometers. Looks like they're firing. Oh, dear. Change alert status to uh, red. Uh, alert status red. Shield generator is is underpowered. Roger that. Tactical oh, officer. I shot the wrong direction. <laughs> Captain, shall I redistribute power to the shields? Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow, did you take out both of them? I think so. <laughs> wow. Do we have another target? I'm shooting. Keep firing. What are our shield status? Shield generator down to 71%. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and arm us with something a little bit nicer. The mosquito. Whatever you do, do it quickly. Life support's down to 41%. Should I request the that shuttle Epsilon to attack them too? Yes. Uh, it looks like we're going down. I oh want you guys goodness. to know that I, I love you all. And <laughs> it was this a is pleasure. Down to 22%, Captain. Keep firing, Tactical. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. You could do a little bit better. <laughs> Captain, I recommend uh, raising power to shield generator. We're, we're out of shields. I will not lose this ship. Captain, uh, repair. Uh, Can we get out of here, Patrick? It takes a really uh, long time to reload. Basic maneuvers. I think this is right. it. We're going to roast these pirates. Yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Woo! We finally yeah! made it! Good work, team. Yeah, that was tough. <laughs> I'm happy we stuck through to the end. I know, yep. I know. <laughs> it's time to play once again. Keep talking and nobody explodes. <laughs> well, uh, we've already played a few times and lots of us have exploded. I exploded. <laughs> Becky Warley from ABC's Good Morning America. Good to see you. Yes. Yes. Also, Greg Farrell from the Packet Pushers Network. You diffused. Uh, even though I'm colorblind. Yeah, yeah. That threw us <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> Mike Elgin, he's been blown up from Fast Company, That's Computer right. World. That's right. Becomingnomad.com. And I'm Leo Laporte, and I am going to wear the headset. So this means I will be the only one who can see the bomb. They have the manual. I can't see the manual. So we need to communicate clearly so that they can tell me what to do to defuse the bomb. I'll have... A mere uh, five minutes in most cases to do this. Should I try a harder yeah, one? Yeah, do a hard one. This is this is actually one of the more fun uh, VR games, even though it's kind of simple. All right, so we, uh, we've we done a few. The only one we've diffused is to double your money. Mm. We did something old, something new, one step up. You want to do pick up the pace, or can I go? Now, see, I'm, yep. none of these are available to me, the really hard ones. So I'm going to have to go back and do pick up the pace. We didn't do that one yet, did we? No. no. All right, here we go. Pick up the pace. Reading this only uses up time you don't have. Chop, chop, you have three minutes and three modules. <laughs> this is a fast one. Are you ready, wow. ladies and germs? I'm ready. No. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, too bad it's starting. Mm-hmm. Uh, the lights are going out. Something we'll be seeing soon. <laughs> uh, I'm in the room. Three minutes. I see the bomb. And I see a hold button. A hold, a hold button. Okay. No. What color is the button? White hold button. Uh, with a red ring around it. Are there more than two batteries in the bomb? Oh my God! Yes, four, yeah. four batteries. You've got to hold hold it down and tell us what color is around so, the ring. All right, it is now a red ring with a blue strip. I'm back on the button. So the blue strip. At least when the countdown timer has a four in any position. Okay, two, one, zero. It's going to take a while. <laughs> Nine, eight, seven. We're really using precious time yeah. here. Five, four, green. Good. Uh, Moving okay. on. Now you are next. Your you you. <laughs> it's got six buttons and a and a readout. So who's on first? So it says you are is the in last this way. way. It's the letter on. U, uh huh. You're as in you are. You and uh huh. But uh huh with a U H U H and uh huh with H U H. He's speaking different. English. I have no uh, idea. This page. This oh, page. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Thirty seconds, you guys. Ah, okay, you so, are. So, <laughs> so press the button that has done in it. There's no button that says done. <laughs> 
Uh, then okay, let's then go to done. this one. I, I was got, literally on the wrong page. <laughs> I, got, means we're I got a maze. I got a bunch of knots. I got two green ones and a red triangle, white square. The red triangle's Whoa. rotating. You guys are really sucking. <laughs> okay. Oh, on the subject of okay, mice. Three, two. I blame you for this. <laughs> One more. Let me One do more. it. Yeah. Who wants to do it? I'm gonna. You. Do it. You I need have, redemption. Have, we need redemption. Need redemption. Yeah. We suck. You guys suck. <laughs> and and do an easy one. I'm kidding. Yeah. This, we ha we've done all of these, but we haven't diffused them. So let me do something old. <laughs> we've done all of new. these, but not successfully. This is gonna give us. So. This is easy. Three <laughs> right. modules, five minutes. Easy. <laughs> Maybe we can achieve that. <laughs> when did the question? When did seeing a familiar bomb becomes comforting? No matter. This bomb will only be half comforting. Okay. Okay. Three modules, five minutes. This should be a cakewalk. Okay. Sure. This is the one they give you in police academy. Okay. This is this the comedy. Is the comedy. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm picking it up. I've got a button, a red button that says detonate. On the subject of buttons. Red button, detonate. Okay. Is there more uh, than one battery on the bomb? Uh, refer to uh, There is just one battery on what the bomb. What color is the strip? Wait a minute. There's more than one battery on the bomb. Is the What color is the button? What color, what color is the strip? There's no strip yet. The button's red. Oh. So press and hold the button and then tell us what the color is around it. And now the color is red, not yellow. Not white, not blue? Not white, not blue, just red. So theoretically, when the countdown timer has a one in any position. Three, two, one. Nope. Okay. If the, the I'm pressing it and say white. Now it's white. If there's more than one battery on the bomb and the button says detonate, press and immediately release the button. Oh, that went well. No, you are so dead. We're good. We got two strikes and I've diffused it because that was the right instruction. <laughs> okay. But I was sitting there holding it. Now we've got wires. I've got six wires. Black, yellow, red, white, black, black. Black, yellow. So that's six? Red, six. white, white. So if there's uh, one. There's more than one white wire? Five. There's one white. One white. It's, it's red, yellow, red, white, black, black. So no yellow wires. Yes, one yellow wire. Is the, how about the last digit of the serial number? Is it odd? The last digit of the serial number is... No, that's just... Cut even. Wire. Isn't it the last of the six wires? It's six wires. Boy, I'm never playing this game. The last wire again. is black? Yeah. Last wire is black. The serial number last digit is odd? It's even. even. Cut the first wire. Cut, cutting the first wire now. <laughs> yeah. But I said it with such certainty. You did. You I, were just, committed. You confidence at all should have saved us. <laughs> well, there's a podcasting network that needs a new primary host. <laughs> I could fill in. <laughs> and that's... Keep wow. Going. Nobody explodes. And Thanks for playing our game, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, I hope you're having fun with our best of episode. Uh, we'll have more in just a second, but first a word from our sponsor, those great folks at Go to webinar. Uh, you've got great information in your mind, great stuff you could teach people. How would you like to do it online so that millions of people could watch live or on demand? What about sales presentations? A great way to get new leads. How about interacting with your customers? Then you need Go to webinar. Go to webinar is huge. The web platform that's hosted more than 2.7 million interactive web events, 60 million views a year. They should be hosting your next webinar. Listen to some of the features. First of all, very easy to set one up. Custom email invitations, confirmations, and reminders. You could even use automated email templates with your company logo, with custom images on all the webinar materials. So it's fully branded with your name, your company. You can create and schedule pre-recorded webinars that are every bit as interactive as live events. And it's mobile friendly, not just for your viewers, but you can use your phone, your iOS or Android device to schedule a webinar, to edit the session, to track performance. Man, talk about tracking great reporting and analytics. You're just a click away from qualified leads, metrics, and data to help improve your webinars. Go to webinar. My favorite feature, the polls. It's really important. I know I've done many go to webinars, and when you're giving this webinar, sometimes you go, well, are they getting it? Are they following it? Or maybe you just want to know more about your audience. Who are they? Where are they? 
Well, you can do that with the polls, up to 20 polls per webinar, each poll with up to 20 questions. You can create them ahead of time. Often that's part of the materials I prepare for my webinar, but you can also do it, and I love this, on the fly. So if you're explaining something complicated and you're not sure if they're getting it, you can on the spot do a quick poll to see if they understand. It makes it more fun for you, more fun for your audience. It's a great way to understand what's going on and frankly generate leads. Uh, I love GoToWebinar. It's not just you, too, by the way. You can engage your audience with more than one presenter and panelist, up to six presenters. Each can share their webcams so your audience is seeing you, but also a view of your desktop or a specific application. And you can hand off back and forth. It is as easy to use as can be, and, and I think it is one of the best solutions for explaining, for training, for communicating. Turn your next presentation into a conversation with GoToWebinar. For more information, visit the website gotowebinar.com slash podcast. That's gotowebinar.com slash podcast. We thank them so much for our, bringing you our best of on this holiday season, getting ready for New Year. Oh, man, I, we're going to have a great New Year of episodes in 2018. But meanwhile, we'll continue our look back at 2017 on the new screensaver. It's been a great year. Welcome to the game of Geeks. It's the Twitch show where we take three contestants and put their tech knowledge to the test. And we've got three contestants that are worthy of the game of Geeks. We've already introduced them in a previous round. Mr. Jason Calicanis, angel investor extraordinaire. Mr. Ian Thompson, he is a reporter for The Register, the nicest person in the studio at the moment. And Leo Laporte. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that because this man signs my paychecks. That's right. It doesn't go to you, though. That's yeah. the irony. It goes to the church. Yeah. Are you ready to play the game of geeks? I am. Right. Okay. Yes. What are we doing? We've got a specific game that we designed for you. This, uh, well, <laughs> okay, we're going to grab the answer. Just a second. And the answer is uh, this game is called Albatross. Sound Bites. It's going to stress your ears as much as it stresses your brain. The idea is you're going to have 10 sounds. That every geek should know. It should, should be in your geek DNA. Chat room? We should yeah. probably turn off the chat room. Absolutely. Because that's how Leo cheats. Now, this is how it's going to work, though. I have people in my ear. You're going to hear a tune. Okay. First person to buzz in gets to try to answer that. If you answer wrong, your buzzer gets locked out, and the other two get to hear it again. Is it all music? It's all music. Oh, all boy. audio. It's, okay. Audio. Uh, audio. Audio or music. It may not okay. be music. All okay. audio. And we just have to audio. name that tune. You just have it's to name a, that tune. It's not a song. It could be a sound. If I could yeah, okay. offer you a bit of advice, though, you're really going to want to <laughs> buzz in and make sure that you've been called before you give the answer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no tipping off no your... No tipping off. Uh, I'm green flashing at the moment. Now you're yellow. Gentlemen. Let's get ready to play the game of geeks. This first tune is something that each and every single one of you should know. So, Anthony, push that button. That's to eat. Uh, oh, sorry. Yell word to Jason. That is um, your phone ringer from a. Um, ooh, five seconds. Oh my God. <laughs> Show, da, 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 da. Gentlemen, gentlemen, wait a minute. We're going to play it again for the remaining contestants. Oh, I know Go. it now. Now I know it. Leo Laporte. It's the I Nokia ringtone. It is. Oh, Ten da, da, points. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, but who remembers Nokia? Okay, wait. We got the cobwebs out. Now we know. Now we okay, know. Right, now but know. Jason, great initiative on, on bringing in. You knew it. I, I knew it. You did. Okay. Before they even played This I one know, I, I, no, I may say, actually be even more iconic than that first one. Gentlemen. T-Mobile. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Oh, boy. Now, before we start, let me just say that this sound came from a man who is now an Uber driver in Ohio. I'm not sure if that's a hint, but at least that's a tip. Oh, damn it. Oh, You've got mail. Damn it. I was gonna... Oh my goodness. Oh, what's up? Oh, what's up? You what? can't do it before the what the fuck? <laughs> he gave the tip, I gave the answer. Give me my points. <laughs> 10 you know, points? You know Oh, I, Do you know his name? I don't know his name. Elwood? I don't need to know Elwood? his name. It doesn't I know matter. His voice. I don't. And, you know, Anthony, go ahead and play it just for fun. You've got, You've got mail. mail. That's incredible. Okay, Jason Calacanis, not only do you get the points, but you get mad respect for that one. Oh, Let's my goodness. Go. All right. Be no careful tip for this one. Way, I had for a while he was trying to make money by recording custom versions. Right. And I have a recording somewhere of him saying, You've got mail, you twit. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> we should have used that. Yeah. All right, here we go with the third clue. No, no, no tips. tips. No tip, because no obviously no reset, tip. The, I'm too reset the buzz. I'm too Houston. good, people. We reset. Too Anthony, good. anytime you have, push the button. 
to Ian. Windows 95 startup soon. Wow, okay, I was gonna settle for Windows, but yes, Windows yes. 95 yeah. startups. <laughs> Fantastic. Who doesn't know that? That is 10 um, points I can to even Ian. tell you who composed it as Eno. well. Yeah, Brian Eno. Wow. Can we get yeah, you know what? We're going to get five bonus points for that. You're yes. going to need to get some more obscure stuff. We're going to have to do a lot points, of bonus points for every, this. That's, yeah, just okay. give him a thousand points. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the sound number four, resetting. And, gentlemen, what is this sound? Leo Laporte. <laughs> <laughs> it's mail going out. That's, yes. Uh, but five what seconds. is it from? I'm going to say it's... It's not at Mac because that's a whoosh. Two seconds. It's uh, Android Mail going out. Oh wait, 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 gentlemen! You get a chance to steal here. Uh, play the sound again. Eudora now. Go uh, oh no, Ian so wrong in. Is it Eudora? <laughs> is it Eudora? Remember the tip about making sure that you were the one who pushed the button. This is a tricky one because I thought I I, don't know I'm kind of iffy on mine. I'm yeah, actually going to go with is. AOL Mail. Okay. J Jason, you do our mouth going up. That's unfortunately also wrong. <laughs> wait, 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 no, uh, Ian, Lisa gets five are. points. Shouldn't I get extra five points for knowing? Well, if you had ones? waited for the sound, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> this is rigged against you. Got your over. points. This is rigged against. I feel like the Warriors last year. <laughs> All right. The whole NBA is against us. Number five, play it. Oh, I know this. Ian. So easy. THX intro. THX intro. Ten oh, points to bitch. Ian. God damn it. I know that sound. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us what key that is? Uh, Leo, no, Jason, but I, I can hate to tell hear you this, Grandpa but, uh, Simpson the grid is running away with an American game. How many Just, more? Uh, do, is there any way of catching up? Oh, yes. <laughs> Two, five more. You're halfway through okay, the game. Okay, don't worry about let's it. Let's go to sound number six. Let's, let's run a bit more this quickly. This is good. I like this one. And we've got sound six. <laughs> Donkey Kong. Ooh. Play it again. Oh. Mario Death. Mario Death. That is the death sound from Super Mario Brothers. Wait, hold on a second. May, you know, we should Mar get the Donkey Kong sound. Because Mario Brothers is Donkey Kong, and I believe it's but the same sound. But he wasn't sound. Mario yet. He I was pre-Mario. I thought no, it was, that's Donkey Kong. That's much the Donkey more Kong that sound. Because it was 8-bit, it was, uh, you know, yeah. that was okay. Mario. Uh, points one to... is based on the other. It's derivative Give me some points. Give me some points. Like Give me some points. <laughs> Ian wow. gets another 10 points. No, he doesn't. No, I don't. Oh, Le yeah, I do. No, no. Leo, oh, Leo, 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 Leo gets 10 points. Leo gets 10 points. Hey, I'll take him, but, you know. <laughs> you know, that bishop who gets your check is going to be mighty. I know. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a little light uh. this week. Okay, still plenty of time to catch up. Let's go ahead and go right. to sound number seven. Ian. Uh, that would be the modem logging in. Oh, no, hang on. Do, 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 do. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, um, AOL. Okay, wait, 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 gentlemen, gentlemen. Damn it. Play it again. Right after the sound, I'm going to enable your buzzers. So. Leo Laporte! I know what it is! It's Skype ring. God damn it. That's it. My father, forgive me. I took the Lord's name in vain. Gosh darn it. I knew it was Skype, and my buzzer's broken. Unbelievable. There are three more. Let's go ahead and with sound number eight. Ian! Oh, I was the first. That, that is a modem login. You were one God. question too early, and yeah. yes, indeed, 10 points for the 56k dial-up tone. Play the whole thing, because we got to tell you, you got to tell me, it's 300 baud. 1,200, 24. That's 4,800. Uh, we're going to I don't think it was 56. because of the boing, 56. boing. The boing, <laughs> boing. boing, boing, boing. <laughs> I, I, you're damn. very good. You should give him extra points. <laughs> two more questions. Two more questions, gentlemen. Uh, oh, someone. Okay. <laughs> not me. Not me. Not me. Happy here. <laughs> if we go with sound number nine. Jason. Uh, oh, come oh, on. That's Windows. You got this. You, Windows. You, <laughs> no? No. Play it one more time. I'm going to enable bum, the buzzers bum, bum, halfway bum. through. Oh, it's... I know what it is. Ian? AOL. 
No. 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 Leo Laporte, you get a chance oh, to no, steal. Oh, right. no, 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 what it is now. I know it. Can I get a save? Can yeah. I get a save? I ah. know it now. I can even name dum, the... Dum, 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 dum. See, I know why I got it wrong, because it does come before the windows. It does, it does. See, that's why I got it wrong. And I need an answer? Well, I know it so well. I want to say the windows shut down so. Yes. No! I know. Can I, can I get a save for yes. half a point? Okay. Will you offer Jason a save? For half a point? Intel. Yes. Oh, Intel. Intel! Give Jason five points. Give Jason five Stupid. points. Give Jason five Stupid. points. Stupid. There we go. Oh, well, see, here's yeah. the thing. It, brain, is, it, comes, it comes right before the windows. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, but, the that's Of course it's Intel. That is indeed. Yeah. All right. Bum, 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 bum. I even Number that 10. Sound. Gentlemen, right. it's very right. close. We've got Leo with 30 points. Ian with 35. Jason with 15. not close for me. Here we go. Sound number 10. Leo Laporte. That is the Macintosh startup sound. No. That is 10 points it right is? there. That yeah. is the Macintosh startup of chime. Of course it is. Leo Laporte with 40 points. Ian with 35. Jason with 15. Leo's already yeah. taking his position to receive the crown of the throne of the game. People of don't understand it's electrified. Oh. Thank you for joining us. And remember, when you play the game of geeks, you either win or we invite you back. <laughs> In the years I've been doing this, uh, the thing that's always moved me the most and amazed me the most is what parents and people in general will do for kids. How about this one? A dad who knew nothing about robotics. It was all new to him. He created a robotic, a working robotic arm for his daughter with the help of a lot of people Watch as we uh, interview Bodo Honan and meet his daughter, Lorelai. This one will tug at your heartstrings. Joining us right now, I'm really excited about this, Bodo Honan. Hello, Bodo. Good to Hi. talk to you. Hi there. Where are you calling from? Um, from Long Island, New York. Long Island, but it doesn't sound like you have the Long Island accent there. No, no, not at all. Um, I was uh, I was born and raised in in Southern Africa, but moved uh, left home when I was 18, and then moved to Europe, um, and uh, all of the uh, the Caribbean for a while, and then moved wow. over here. You sound like our producer uh, Jerry uh, Wagley, who's been all over the world. <laughs> anyway, it's great to have you on. I love this story. Yeah. So your how old is Lorelai, your daughter? Lorelai's turned six, so, so she's, she's just a she's, little girl. Oh. Yeah, she's just a little girl. Sweetie. And she, got, she and she got an illness that paralyzed her arm. Yeah, it happened really suddenly. So so she got sick uh, a week before this all happened, and her sickness had gone away. And then um, the, the morning uh, when this all happened, she complained that she can't move her, her arm. Um, and we didn't think much of it. We thought maybe she, she fell and she bruised, uh, she bruised it. But... By by the end of uh, by the end of the morning, her, her arm was completely paralyzed, and her legs oh. were starting to be paralyzed. She struggled to breathe. She wasn't speaking oh properly, my. so we rushed. My wife rushed her to the hospital. I was away on on business at the time, um, but my wife rushed her to to hospital. And by the time she got in hospital, so this was just in a matter of a couple of hours. Um, she had lost the use of her arm. Her, her, her breathing was was really really faint. Her voice was was really faint. The left side of her face was paralyzed, um, and the doctors didn't know what was happening and what was wrong with her. Um, turned out she has acute. She had acute flaccid myelitis, which is a a very rare condition. It's a polio-like syndrome. Um, about a hundred or so kids have had it here in the U.S. so far, and um, so none of the doctors actually knew what was happening. Holy um, cow! But it it was so we went straight to the to the uh, PICU ICU, um, and that's when it all started. So the good news is, with physical therapy, she can can she get recover uh, the use of her arm? Well, and and that was that was really the start of it. So so I had I quickly flown back and speaking to the doctors and, and the specialists, um, they told us about this rare condition and, and um, told us that, you know, the, the only real form of treatment would be physiotherapy. 
Um, so, so that night I spent the evening, you know, Googling all I could about this, this disease, this illness, and I managed to get hold of some specialists that had treated this condition out in California. And I also managed to get hold of a couple of parents that had children with the same condition. And um, reading, reading up what, what they, would, they were telling about these kids, there was only about a 5% chance that these kids would, would have a full recovery. So yes, uh, physiotherapy would help, but there would only be a 5% chance of a full recovery. So it wasn't, it wasn't good odds. So you decided to take matters into your own hands. Yeah. But you have no robotics experience. No, absolutely no robotics experience, but um, listen to podcasts and shows like this. So I, I, I knew what was able to be done. I just did, had no clue how to do it. So where did you start? How did you, how did you start down this path of self-education and, and building uh, technology for your daughter? Uh, we just boiled down the problem. So we, we knew her shoulder was extremely weak, it couldn't carry any weight. Um, even the weight of her own arm would, would slowly pull it out of the socket. So um, my, my wife made a, a, a shoulder brace, a shoulder a sleeve, and then we also used kinesio tape and we taped the shoulder and with the shoulder brace and the kinesio tape, we could keep the, the, the shoulder or the arm from pulling out of the socket. And we, we looked at that we could put about 150 grams of additional weight on the arm without there being any risk of it pulling out. So, so that was our, our target weight goal was we wanted to keep, build something that was no more than 150 grams um, and, and, so, and therefore wouldn't pull out her, her, her arm. Um, we, we then measured her forearm. Uh, the weight was about 400 grams. So we knew that whatever we built would need to be able to pick 400 grams up and down um, several times an hour for at least five hours because we wanted this whole device to be mobile as well. Um, and then I, I guess one of the key points here was, and this was something that I had researched. Um, oh, here's my here's my daughter. She wants to say hi. Hi, Lorelai, hi. you sweetie. Oh, she's hi, hi Lorelai. Hello. Hi. Oh, you are the <laughs> sweetest. I can see, Frank, I, I mean, Frank, I'm sorry. Bodo, I can see why you Ooh. would be so motivated. This is a father's love. Yeah. Boy. Oh, yeah, she wants to hear some more. Back. Can you show us yeah. your can you show us your arm, Lorelai? Does oh, she have the Does she have the robot on right now? No, she doesn't. But we've okay. got it here. Oh, look at oh, that! We got, we got the sleeve here. So, so this is the 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 sleeve, and she she puts it on her arm, and then she can control it um, using muscle sensors, um, and it can pull her arm up and down. Wait a minute! You had never done this before, and you created this. Look at this. Yeah. So she controls this <laughs> yeah. with her mind? Well, she controls it with, with her mind using the, the signals going down to, to her muscles. And that was, that was one of the key goals because we wanted to increase the chances of rehabilitation to take place. Um, and the only way to do that, and, and we, we researched this while in hospital, we saw that um, there were these, uh, these trials going on where uh, paraplegic individuals were, were given these exoskeleton suits and virtual reality, and, and they were, um, over a course of, of several months, they were able to start to use their own, their own muscles. Um, so so we, that's we the key, to... right, is to do it the way you would do it normally, to keep those, yeah, those nerves working and the mind connection working. You don't want to take over for yeah. her. You want to help her exactly. learn and get better at it. So that looked like yeah. a 3D printed yeah. Device. Is that what yeah. you ended up doing? Is 3D printing the shell there? Yeah, we ended up 3D printing. So um, cool. And it was this was a challenge because we first we first tried to 3D print it to fit perfectly uh, to fit her arm perfectly, but then we battled to put it on her her arm. Um, so we ended up printing it flat using PLA plastic, and then I made a cast of her arm, and then we would you know, put the plastic in boiling water. And then mold it around the cast. Um, yeah, there, there we go. Um, and so that really worked really, really well. And it it allows us to to quickly tweak the the fit. I can just take a, a hair dryer and, and heat it up a bit, or heat the joint up and, and tweak it a little if it if it gets too too uh, too tight. Um, and so that approach actually worked really, really well. 
Oh. Now, in order to do this, obviously, you had to enlist the help of some experts. How did you go about doing that? <laughs> yeah, hundreds of experts. So, That's so uh, great. again, we, we didn't know what 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 we, what we were doing. So uh, we not we knew we needed you know X, Y, and Z, and we we created a video and we shared this video with with folks on Twitter and we, uh, and, and Facebook, and we started a Facebook page, and we had a whole number of questions and and things we needed to figure out. And we just posted this online and asked people for advice. And uh, I mean, literally within moments, people started to 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 respond and help us. And uh, people we had never met before started to help us. Um, there's a a good friend of ours now, Jose. He's from from Mexico, and and he's been helping us a great deal. He he first taught us how to program the Arduino and wire up the Arduino, um, and we had initially built this this separate arm rig so that we can test anything everything on the arm rig um and and he helped us wire things up and program things up but then we we got help from columbia university helped us with the 3d wow. design um actuonics donated some of the uh of the uh, uh, actuators to us um the the uh, folks from uh, various friends had donated things like the the Xbox Connect that we used as a, a 3D scanner, so that we could scan the um, the uh, the measurements of our arm in, in 3D. Uh, but we got help from all over. That was great. That's this is amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Facebook uh, page is facebook.com/slash Our Kids Can Do Anything. And it's a wonderful page. What what do you do for a living, Bodo? Um, I I run a, a nonprofit that that works to empower children ah. to to reach for for their dreams. Nice. And, and well, especially children that have absolutely nothing. So children in refugee camps, conflict zones, disaster areas. Um, Is that something so, you were doing before Lorelai's illness? Yeah. Yeah. So so you don't have any technical background, you, uh, but obviously you I, have a, a background organizing. You have a little bit of a technical background. Yeah, yeah, I, I do, and, and I, I, I was a programmer about ten oh, years ago. Good, but I, um, but you, I had you gave it up for de honest work. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you've been using this. The Arduino controls it. Her her nerve impulses control it. And what yeah. kind of does she do exercises? What does she do with it? Well, the idea was that she would use it for for anything so she would it's a totally mobile unit she can take it to school she can go go to wow. the playground she can do everything with it um and it would simply just assist her to move her arm up and down um and it again it it it, it uses her existing muscle signals but i i guess that that was one of the biggest challenge because challenges because the the muscle signal going to her bicep and tricep was extremely extremely weak right um and it was so weak that we would pick up her heart beating as opposed to her muscle, or we would we would pick up some random electrical uh, signal coming from the microwave or the the lights or you know the, the the computer or whatever was was close to her, the air conditioner. And so, um, wow, it, that that was a that was a big challenge for us, and that it took us quite a while to sort to to work out that problem and we we managed to sort it out by using um yeah using machine learning so instead of just using a singular electrode to to look out for a a signal from the arm and then this singular electrode would would normalize the the signal and it would filter out the noise um but whenever you filter out the the signal you use a lot of information um and and somewhere within that noise was this signal that we had to find. So instead of just using the one, we used several all around the arm, and we we fed all of this raw data into a um, into a unit that that a company called Coact helped us with. Um, and with this unit here, you can see on the screen. So you see these these 18 electrodes on her arm, and she's moving her. She's so she's sending signals to her arm. And the the unit is able to pick that up and move this this virtual arm, and so yeah, on the screen you can see how it works. This is remarkable. Uh, so, what kind of progress have you seen? How how is ha, have you seen progress in her arm strength? 
Yeah, and this is this is the the best Christmas present ever. So, um, beginning of December, Lorelai comes up to to my my wife and I, and she says, "Hey, look what I can do!" And and she she pulls up her arm all the way up and down without the oh. assistive arm. On. And oh my god! Uh, immediately, my my wife and I we we start crying. Yes. And, and we we absolutely. Uh, You're making me cry. <laughs> it it was it was amazing and you know since this since that moment she's she's really progressing by leaps and bounds and now uh to the stage where she no longer needs the the arm wow. brace um so she's wow. she's getting physiotherapy at school and the doctors and everyone's amazed at her progress and and so are we and we just we thrilled so i i guess now we now what we're doing is we during this this process we met a lot of other kids that that could use something like this and so we we reaching out with them, and we 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 trying to help them to see, you know, if if they could see the same progress, and, and yeah. Poto, what an inspiring story, and that just shows you how a father's love, and I'm sure mother's love as well, can yeah, make such yeah. a difference. And then the and then pulling a community together, and how tech can really be a positive force. I mean, in every respect. This is such an inspiring and, and heartwarming story. Well, and to know, just as you sought out people when you got her diagnosis, that I'd imagine it's already happened, but people will yeah. look for their diagnosis and they'll discover you and what yeah. you've built now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Facebook.com slash our kids can do anything. And I presume you're going to continue to update us on uh, Lorelei's progress. And now yeah. I think the progress of this incredible uh, uh, venture uh, yeah. and how you're helping kids uh, in other ways. This is so great. Bodo, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I Absolutely. Really, really inspiring. Thanks, Lorelai. See you later. Lorelai, they want to say bye. Okay, <laughs> she's out playing. She's gone. You could see why <laughs> you're inspired. And, you know, I know when, I, when a child is ill, and, I, you know, I'm a father, when a child is ill, there's nothing worse. And to be yeah. able to take action, to do something, to get all this support and then to have it make a difference. Wow. I mean, oh. congratulations. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Bye, Bye. Lorelai, you darling. Oh my goodness, is she sweet. Just, Thank you, Lorelai. Just a, just a very just a very quick thing. She wanted to show you. So 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 instead of uh, working on her arms, she she asked me, "Can can we build a suit to help her fly?" So she wants to fly, <laughs> fly around. <laughs> it's a Barbie so. drone. Yes, Lorelai, yeah. you know what? You can do so, anything now. So this wow. is a Barbie drone. Um, this is the first prototype, and we said, I'll, I'll think about building a life-size <laughs> one for her. What a doll. Well, to be fair, you did yeah. say our kids can do anything, and flying counts <laughs> yeah. You set that up, Bodo. So, you yeah. set it up. <laughs> Thank you, Bodo Honan. Really appreciate it, and oh. congratulations to you and Lorelai. Facebook.com slash our kids can do anything. Thank you, Bodo. Bye, Lorelai, you darling. See you later. Bye. Oh, I'm gonna cry. Oh my God. That was wow. amazing. Amazing. A lot of folks in tech these days say they're doing what they're doing to save lives and make the world a better place, but Katanjali Rao really is, and she's only 11 years old. Inspired by the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, Katanjali created her own device that reduces the time of lead detection in water by using a mobile app to connect over Bluetooth to get the status of water almost immediately. Her invention recently also won her the 2017 Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge Award. Welcome to the show, Gitanjali. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about your device. Yeah, so I developed a device to detect lead in water faster than the current techniques out there today. So you were inspired. You, you saw your parents uh, trying to test water. You're, you're not in Michigan. You're in Colorado. But you're, yeah. you're, your parents were testing the water. And, and what, what gave you the idea to create this device? I hadn't thought about creating a device until I saw my parents testing for lead in our water using test strips. And I realized that it wasn't a very reliable process as it took them quite a few tries in order to actually um, um, find out if our water was safe or not. So um, I wanted to do something to change this, not only for my parents, but for the residents of Flint and places like Flint around the world. It's pretty much just a blue box with a white cartridge, which attaches and you just have to dip the cartridge in the water you wish to test. And it, it's called Tethys? Is that how you pronounce Te it? Tethys. And where yes. does the name come from? 
Yeah, it's the Greek goddess of fresh water. So I decided to give it a, a bit of a unique name. <laughs> so, so you have an Arduino in there. Uh, where did you do any testing with other with other parts first? What what was part of your process? What did you try first? Um, well, first I started with um, the simple idea of um, just a device. I didn't have like the concept of carbon nanotubes or. Um, just the chemical reactions between lead and chloride, which is the base of my device. Um, I started out with just plain chemical reactions like we find in today's test strips. And then I started getting into the idea of displaying it on a mobile phone instead of using an LED system with red, yellow, and green lights. And when I tried to display it on a mobile phone, I was deciding between if I wanted to use an Arduino processor or um, a Raspberry Pi. Um, I thought that an Arduino processor would work better since um, I had more experience with coding Arduino processors. So those are kind of the steps I took in order to develop um, my conceptual idea. So you coded the app all by yourself? Yes, I did. How did you, did you what did you use to code, code the app? Um, I used the application called the MIT App Inventor software, and this allowed me to use a drag and drop code in order to connect over Bluetooth and the app itself and create a page where you could check your status and it would give you the status of slightly contaminated, um, safe or critical according to your water status. So obviously you are very intelligent, um, but I hear that you had a little help. Tell us about what, what kind of help, what uh, mentors you had with this project. Yeah, so um, once I was selected as a finalist, um, I was assigned a 3M scientist mentor. Um, my mentor was Dr. Kathleen Schaefer, and she helped me with more of my experimentation plans and helping me make sure that I have taken all like safety and disposal requirements into consideration in my project as well. And this ensures that, um, that I don't rush and go ahead and do the experiment before I, um, I have all the materials. So I read that your parents were also very helpful, but they, they thought that maybe you would just, you had this idea and maybe you would just um, try it for a while and it, the experience would be good. They, were, were they not, were they surprised that, that you were actually able to complete this? Um, yes, to an extent they were. Um, they did help me a lot with um, my like acquiring items that I needed and for transportation as well to like the science company where I received my chemicals. So they were a huge help in this journey. Okay, so you, you won $25,000. Uh, do you have any idea what you're gonna do with that money? Yeah, with most of the money, I plan to continue evolving my device so that it um, I can perform um, false positive tests in order to ensure that it's accurate. And then after that, I would like to put it out um, into the market as commercially available so that it can be in everyone's hands. So it sounds like the parts you use is probably wouldn't be very expensive to make and produce. Do you have any idea how much something like this might cost an average person to buy? An average person to buy, including the device itself and the cartridge, it would cost approximately $20. So what are, what are you working on next? Um, next, I would like to do something in the fields of gene editing, since that sounds like a, a very interesting topic to me. And something like a happiness detector as well, since um, uh, I know that adolescent depression is a pretty big thing out there today. And that's another real world problem that I want to tackle. So, so what advice, Katanjali, would you have for kids your age or even older or, or younger, uh, besides yeah. telling their parents to get them a science room? What, what kind of <laughs> advice would you have them uh, to, what, for them for their ideas? Something that I would tell anybody, um, including kids and adults, is to not be afraid to try. Since um, when I originally started coming up with scientific ideas um, and problems that I wanted to possibly find solutions to. Um, I was very worried that I would get to like this far of creating an idea and then not being able to perform any of the experiments since I didn't know how to do them. Um, so then I learned that failure is just another step to succeeding. And um, I like to tell many people that so that um, when they have an idea and they're not sure that if they can create it, it doesn't hurt to try at all. Um, and pretty much, I think that every problem in this world can be solved.
Gitanjali, thank you so much for joining us. You are totally an inspiration. Gitanjali Rao is an almost 12-year-old. She's still 11 for nine more days. Uh, and she is the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge Award winner. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Our next segments are all about food. We're going to take a trip next door to visit the famous Lagunitas Brewery. There's a lot of tech there. Then we're going to eat crickets. I'm not kidding, but this may solve the world food crisis from tiny farms. And finally, we solve the great cheeseburger emoji debate with a real-time taste test. Watch. Brewing is the second oldest profession in the world. We don't have to really go into what the oldest one is, yeah. <laughs> but there's some good guesses out there. Uh, my favorite guess was male modeling. So I went into brewing because it's a very old uh, profession, and as much as brewers have tried to, to change it and evolve it and to inject technology into it, it always goes back to the basics, you know, mixing hot water and grain and separating things you want from things that you don't want in a series of conversions. So that was part of my attraction. But as Lagunitas uh, grew and faced the reality of uh, trying to make the exact same beer uh, in larger quantities and then across multiple different locations, how do we do this and do it right? And then it became very obvious to us, technology is your friend. Before, we had a bunch of human beings running around with timers or on their phone remembering to do certain key things at, at key moments, such as uh, at 2.42 p.m., that's when the hops go in. At 2.55 p.m., that's when a finding agent goes in, things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy, as you know, humans, um, there's plenty of human error in humans. It's part of the beauty of uh, us not being machines, and they make mistakes, and then you end up with like a sine curve around what you want. So when you move over to machines, they kind of execute flawlessly, but they have within them, you know, various parameters. Human beings are better at winging it. You know, they see a little bump in the road and they go around it and they just keep going. Machines, depending on their instructions, you know, they just, they just stop and they, they're not creative. It's tightened either end of the sine curve where the variability used to be like this with humans. And then now it's, you know, now it's just like that. So. We've been able to set uh, specifications for every single parameter in our beer. And then we have a lot of different parameters, not just the obvious ones like, you know, the strength of sugar, alcohol, hops, pH. You know, there's a lot of different stuff, uh, color, the list goes on and on. All of a sudden, we were able to set specifications and consistently meet them. And I think the way that that plays out out in trade is customers all of a sudden come back to the beer that they remembered liking. And then when they consume it, they have the same experience that they remember having the last time. And that's what we want. Now the, the brewer that used to run around and do everything by hand now kind of sits at the top of a pyramid and is kind of on the, on the pinnacle of process control. We've got over 400 valves, you know, 300 sensors, and they all work with a, you know, a feedback loop, uh, P and ID controllers and things like that. And I'll tell you what, as soon as you have more than 400 or 500 of anything, the statistical chances that one of them is just going to fail yeah. at some point in time will happen. So, so bringing some of the automation into the process of what Lagunitas does, what are the tangible benefits, uh, you know, both from the business side, but also just for the way it tastes and what people actually get when they're buying your beer? The number one benefit is that it makes the brewer's hands free to worry about a much higher level set of problems. You know, we have uh, brewers that never had the opportunity to uh, pursue their own like research projects. So they could come up with new flavors, yep. new beers, new recipes. And there are other areas where it would really take the fun out of it. So no part of me can really imagine um, our brewery and our beer being the result of a fully automated process. So why is it important to have that human element? Like what, what makes the people part of this so special? I mean, you see, you, we see the benefits of bringing the tech into it, but you're still holding on to this core of human beings. Well, the most obvious answer is that human beings have this amazing lab equipment right here. 
So brewers from the, the raw materials, they've got, you know, hops and grain and they're, as soon as they open the bag, even if they're not even thinking about it, they smell the smell that comes out of it and it registers, you know, sense of smell is a very interesting thing because it bypasses the processing part, you know, the frontal cortex, it goes straight to your limbic system, which is your, your memory, your, your, your fight or flight, you know, your, your animalistic instinctual brain, whether you like it or not, that sense of smell and your sense of taste, I really, you know, can't imagine, certainly right now, there's no robotics or machines, you know, they've got little robotic noses that can supposedly smell and, you know, there's really, I don't know, you know, every time I, I pour my beer into my computer, bad things happen. <laughs> Hasn't worked out Really yet. bad things happen. After that, I think it's, you know, it's all romanticism, you know, it's this, this idea that, uh, you know, beer, especially our kinds of beers that have this, you know, heavy uh, aroma and, and very hoppy and floral and all these nice aromas. Uh, the romantic notion that beer is made by grumpy brewers, you know, guys with beards or girls in overalls, uh, you know, always grumpy though, um, <laughs> and uh, marching around, you know, carrying things and dumping things and stirring and checking stuff out and making all kinds of judgment calls. And it's, it's interesting because we work with a living organism. You know, brewers don't make beer. Mm -hmm. Yeast makes beer. We're zookeepers. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we, we have a, a job back there that's a yeast rancher. Yeah. It'd be an interesting thing to trust a machine to, to, to care after something that's living. Although we all know that it's coming, right? I mean, even in plants that are today 100% uh, automated, you know, there's always a human somewhere that is kind of looking after everything. You know, it's like seven to 8,000 breweries now in the United States. The vast bulk of those are really, really, really small. So it is, in many cases, just one person doing everything by hand. And that, to them, that's the pinnacle of craft brewing. But you, you talk to some that have worked at large breweries and you say, how did you feel, and you worked at a production brewery for 20 years, and for 10 years straight, mm -hmm. all you did was lift boxes of hops and pour them with a scoop into this. And yeah. you did that day in and day out yeah. for 10 years. I mean, you start, to, you, you start to see like, huh, wouldn't you have been a lot happier if you were doing something else that whole time? And maybe there was a machine doing that part of the job. And then they think, oh yeah, you know, my back hurt from, you know, lifting that five millionth box. And it's like, yeah, you know, the, the machine's backs never hurt, right? It sounds like you see that role at some point, at least for Lagunitas, like never really being eradicated. We have quite a few uh, processes here right now that are 100% manual, uh, such as like dry hopping and things like that, uh, that at other breweries that are like some of our competitors, it already is an, an automated process. And it's very easy for me to look at that and say, oh, that just takes all the fun out of it. But at the same time, a little part of me is like jealous because I'm like, oh, you know, part of that is like heaving all these boxes of hops and getting them in the tank. That's, you know, borders on drudgery. Yeah. So for me, I think the biggest area where uh, automation is 100 percent my friend every time. And I will consider, you know, if it's going to be two or three or four hundred thousand dollars versus, you know, spending nothing and just continuing to do it how you do it would be like safety. You know, if you've got a, a, an area where uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys lifting things and straining their backs or somewhere where there's maybe high probability for something bad to happen over time because due to say re repetitive motion and things like that. I think one area that uh, I know that, that we are working on but we're doing it in a real creative way is, um, you know, what information is out there and, and what's important and how to bring into relief the very most important part, which is all about making sure that the customer gets what they expect and they don't get an old beer and they always have a nice experience. That's very important to us. We'll have more with our best of episode in just a bit, but right now I want to remind you one of the best products of this year, frankly, was one of the best products of last year. Eero was introduced early in 2016. 
Uh, I think I got an Eero system almost right away. And, and I did because of one simple thing. Lisa was saying almost every day, Leo, the Wi-Fi's down again. Oh, and I had a great route. I thought it was a great router, but here's the problem. We had 4,500 square feet. There were plenty of corners in the house where you couldn't get any Wi-Fi or on the TVs, it would buffer, it would hesitate, it would slow down. We really needed to, we were in a Wi-Fi crisis. Along comes Eero and I installed, I think three Eero devices, it's about one per 1,500 square feet. It covers your house. No more dead spots, no more buffering. Best of all, no more Leo, the Wi-Fi's down. And the new Eero Plus, it's even better. I actually gave the old Eero's to my mom, installed the new Eero Plus, the base station, the beacons, which plug right into the wall. You don't, no wires or anything, you just plug them right into the wall. They actually act as night lights. So I put them in the halls on either end of the house. Now it's blanketed with Wi-Fi. They're tri-band, they have two 5G radios and a 2.4 gigahertz radio. It's about twice as fast as the original Eero. And they've even added a thread radio, uh, which connects to low power devices. So if you have locks, or doorbells or other sensors, it works beautifully with the Eero. And Eero Plus means I have complete control over my network. More importantly, I have complete control over Michael's network, our 15-year-old. When, it, when it's bedtime, and I have it set on a schedule, automatically Eero turns off just his devices. See, every device in our Eero network is assigned to, can be assigned to a user, can be named. So I got Michael's iPhone, his iPad, his computer, no more internet after 10 p.m. And if I need to, I can even do it by saying echo, pause Michael's Wi-Fi. By the way, he can't say echo, turn it back on. We actually have to go into the app to do it. The app is a really wonderful thing. I can see my mom's network. I can see my network. I can see the bandwidth. It does periodic bandwidth checks. Am I getting everything I paid for? I can see what devices are using the most bandwidth. And Eero's always improving. Oh, you know, when there's firmware updates, they happen automatically. The crack exploit, they patched it within 24 hours. I just, I trust my Eero. I love my Eero. And I know you'll love it too. That's why we got a great deal. Free overnight shipping, so you can get it fast. Start your new year right with an Eero. Go to Eero.com. Pick out the Eero system you want. You need enough to cover your, your floor plan, upstairs, downstairs, the backyard, wherever you need it to be. And then just check the box that says overnight shipping. Add the offer code NSS and it's free. Just zeroes it right out. That's eero.com, offer code NSS. The best Wi Fi. The, it's modern. The, enter the 21st century with Eero, eero.com. And don't forget to use that offer code NSS for free overnight shipping. All right, now back we go to the best of the new screensavers for 2017. Enjoy. Hey, you know what you can make from crickets? You can make cookie crisps. These are made out of cricket flour. You can make, I don't know why you would want to, but this is Critter Bitters. This is for your alcohol bitters. You know, you make a old yeah, fashioned old with fashioned. bitters. We got this supplies is, back This here is for a that. pure cricket tincture. Crickets are all the rage right now. On the, <laughs> on the line right now, the guys who make this, this is cricket flour and delicious roasted crickets. And, and look at this, Toaster, really, <laughs> he is Toaster really wants some. On the line right now from Tiny Farms, it's Andrew Brentano. He's the founder and chief operating officer. Tiny Farms is using data-driven design to build sustainable cricket farms for use in food. Hey, Andrew. Hey, how's it going? So tell me how you got involved in cricket production. <laughs> uh, it's a, that's a good question that we get asked a lot. Um, a few years ago, we were looking at uh, the food system, kind yeah. of trying to think about where's our food come from, trying to understand, you know, what's going on here, and asked a few questions to ourselves: Where are all the resources being used? What's really uh, the most, you know, biggest piece of the resources being used to make our food? Um, are those resources being used efficiently? Um, are they being used in a resilient way? And the answer to those were, it's all going to meet, and it's not very efficient, and it's not very resilient to changes, you know, in the environment. Uh, that can affect food production. And so then we thought, well, let's look at the alternatives. Let's see what's out there. And we found that there was all this uh, kind of historical practice of eating insects and all the scientific uh, literature on why it's a good idea, why they're incredibly healthy, why they're really efficient. We said, let's, uh, let's give this a go. I remember seeing an interview with uh, Elon Musk's brother. I can't remember his name, but he, he, he was talking about how the next big 
you know, opportunity in investing mm -hmm. in the kind of thing you do, Kevin, is food. That the, the reinventing how we make and eat and distribute food is going to be everything from from these you know meatless burgers. Have you tried that one? That's all the rage. Everybody right Everybody did the impossible, the impossible burger. burger. I didn't get yeah. to have one, but everybody was raving about it. You had one, Anthony, right? He said it was good, right? It bleeds. Yeah, I don't. Mm -hmm. That's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's what people need. That's what they want, right? They want to think they're eating meat. Right. So this is a hot area right now. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at investments in this? Yeah, in this actually, area? we had we had when I was at Google Ventures, we had them come in. Several companies come in and pitch us um, different Cer startups. Sergey is, is big into some, one of these. I know. Yeah, uh, hamburger thing. Never crickets though. This is this is a new well, one. Why crickets, a Andrew? Tell me why crickets are a good choice. Uh, so. When we were trying to decide, we knew we wanted to look at insects and see how we could get this into the food system. Crickets, it turns out, are pretty acceptable to people out in general. So you're there, you have a uh, cricket in front of you. They're not scary uh, when you try them. They've got a very good flavor. Uh, uh, they do look like bugs. How are they? Uh, how are these crickets prepared? They're not not scary, though. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, you know, don't cultures all over the world eat crickets and grubs and other critters? Yeah. yeah. So people think there's probably about 2 billion people on the planet eating bugs daily. Yeah. I mean, they're just, it's what you're used to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the cricket flower is very approachable. I mean, that's, how, right. how, that's pretty. That's ground up? That's just that's pulverized? Just, Dehydrated whole crickets ground into a powder. And can so, you use this uh, it, as, as, as a regular flour in baking and things? You'd use it um, like you'd use a nut meal, like flax meal. It, it's very high in protein. It doesn't have the kind of gluten binding properties that white flour has. Right. So, you, so you couldn't ri raise the bread. It wouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Now, right. I've, I've seen some people eat cricket flour and use it for the protein. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just say I, I took a couple tablespoons here of this cricket flour what, what are mm -hmm. we talking protein wise like uh how many grams so it's about 60 percent protein by weight let's say you ate 100 grams you'd get 60 grams of protein wow that's pretty good if you're working out hitting the gym a little protein a little cricket protein i just bought a nintendo <laughs> switch i'm sorry i distracted <laughs> <laughs> Let's go see. ahead. Go ahead. Let's see you. Go ahead. Toaster. Oh, no. I know the dog's going to eat well, let's it. Let's just sit. High five. Dance. He, oh, wow. Dance one more time. Yeah, he's going to say, that's not a treat, Dad. That's a cricket. What is he? Oh, uh, he spit it out. It's got chili lime on it. Oh, he, he won't, he won't like eat this. it. He chili. won't eat it. <laughs> it's chili. Okay, but watch. What? These are delicious. Mmm. They're so good. Come on, Kevin. You got it. It's really all right, good. All right. Let me try a little. You were, if you were watching TV, you were watching a football game... <laughs> we think that the bar bad. snacks perfect for this. They're actually not bad at you all. Know, it reminds me of pork rinds a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. There's a weird okay. There's Andrew, a little. There's, there's a, little, a weird after thing coming in at the end. <laughs> Did they keep them refrigerated? Yes. For you? Did you keep them refrigerated? Yeah. Are we gonna get food poisoning here? Did someone not refrigerate <laughs> these? Yes. You have to keep. Do they have high fat? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do they have high fat content. So crickets. Uh, have a reasonably high fat content. It's mostly like omega-3 long chain good stuff. unsaturated acid. Okay. So it's really good for you, but it does go rancid if you don't keep it refrigerated okay. after, you've, after you've cooked it. Because that's why it has a lot of fat in it. And then uh, how about protein? Is he, I mean, traditionally bugs are good for protein, right? Yeah, like the uh, powder, those are, since they're fried actually, they're going to be a little lower percentage-wise, maybe 50% okay. by weight protein, but still wow, you're 50 basically that's eating still protein. Wow, that's more than steak. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. So, so how many uh, crickets do you slaughter per, per day? And how do you slaughter them? Do <laughs> yeah, how do you slaughter? Like hit them on the head with, <laughs> with a hammer? <laughs> so when you think of like uh, beekeepers, you know how they have that can of smoke that they yeah. use to calm down the bees? Yeah. What's happening is all insects um, are anesthetized by CO2. So we use a little CO2. We knock them out. Once they're asleep, we put them in a freezer and they just never wake up. Well, that's a good way to do it. I thought you were frying them or something, but that, I guess no, that, comes that comes later. these are fried, but you later. kill them first, yeah. 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 Um, how, how, okay, so how much uh, food do they eat? In other words, you know, you talk a lot of times about cows and how much water it takes mm -hmm. for one pound of steak and how much feed it takes, and it's really completely upside down. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really eating way too mm -hmm. high in the food chain. Is this, would you call this high in the food chain or low in the food chain? What do they need to make a pound of crickets? 
Exactly. It's, uh, they call it the trophic scale. It's how high up and down you are. And so crickets are quite low. You need about two pounds of feed to get one pound of cricket, whereas you're oh, looking at wow. anywhere from eight to 25 pounds of feed for a cow. Two pounds for one pound. So it's a two to one. What type of feed are you? Is it just a... Carrots, it looks like. Carrots? Yeah, so the uh, our adult crickets get vegetables to give them moisture um, because they will lay eggs in any other form of water we give them. Um, the uh, normal crickets just get water, and the feed because these are grown for food is very similar to chicken feed. It's a vegetarian, non-GMO, uh, pesticide-free, uh, grain-based feed. It's awesome. So, how expensive is it to make a? Uh, I, obviously, a cricket. Nobody makes a cricket. Look at that's the little baby crickets. They're yeah. like little like <laughs> price per cricket. <laughs> what's, what's the cost yes. per pound? These I guess. days, uh, it costs a couple <laughs> dollars a pound to produce uh, fresh crickets. That's going to go down a lot as we are able to increase the scale, get economies of scale on inputs and processing, etc. So the biggest problem you have, by the way, this is this is a, a startup. You came out of an accelerator called Food System Six. That's kind of neat. <laughs> so this is a a food startup? Yeah, so we've been around for a couple of years. Uh, we just went through Food System 6, uh, which is a brand new food system focused accelerator. We were in their guinea pig batch. Um, it. It, was, it was cool because a few years ago, there was really no ecosystem for food tech or agriculture startups. Uh, you know, if you were making an app for anything, there's a roadmap, you know, there's an investment pathway. People understand how it's gonna scale. People have started to realize, hey, everyone eats. This is a huge market. This is a great opportunity. There's also a lot of problems and inefficiencies in the supply chain for food. So it's, you know, we can bring some innovation in there. And, uh, and now we're seeing uh, this Food System 6, uh, big banks like Rabobank, which is a duck, Dutch bank that invests in food and agriculture, uh, starting accelerator programs. The whole ecosystem is starting to evolve very quickly. Wait a minute, one of them has escaped. Wait, minute, I gotta get that one. Okay, that's good. I got it. And you've open sourced this entire thing to share with other people. That's I love that. Tell us about that. So we have two uh, kind of two sides of our business. We have our proprietary large scale uh, cricket farm system, and then we have an open source project we started a couple of years ago. Open bug farm. Really, I love it. And this is for more of your home grower, or you want to think about starting your own business, but you want to learn more about it. We've got. The bulk of this is a forum where we've got people all over the world sharing information, answering each other's questions. We contribute information. Uh, we've got some designs for uh, mealworm farming kits. People have shared their home setups and small commercial setups for cricket farming, snail farming, all sorts of insects. Uh, if, you know, if you're interested in this, this is a great resource to come and just absorb a huge amount of information that's collected there. So, so I've obviously heard of crickets a, a bunch now. It's becoming a pretty popular thing. Who's your biggest competitor in terms of insects? <laughs> like what, what's number two? Are like mealworms? Ants? Ants? Roaches? So in terms of production, mealworms are probably next in line. Uh, they're very easy to grow and pretty inexpensive. They taste good uh, oh, when you toast cute. them. They're kind of like popcorn. Oh, uh, yeah. But crickets are kind of going to be our gateway bug. <laughs> Isn't there yeah, though? I mean, especially to eat them. with the whole cricket, there's. Uh, I think you have a little bit of a cultural, you know, hurdle to get over, right? We mostly have the whole crickets kind of for fun. You know, oh, okay. people, we'll take them to tasting events. We will sell them to people if they want them. Uh, but the cricket powder is really where this is going to get into the Western these, market. These could really grow on me. I'm starting to really. Are you I'm serious? starting to really like them. Yeah. They're yeah, good. I know you have been, like, even when the camera's been shut off, you're still eating them, mm -hmm. which is I love impressive. <laughs> I feel so bad. Wait a minute. I really feel bad because Toaster didn't like them, and I think it's because it's chili lime. Yeah, that's right. He so we like got a bark guy. box here. Give him here. some of the, uh, the powder there. You think yeah, he'd he... like the powder? Pick a, pick oh, a treat because I, mean, I feel bad because love... you made Toaster dance and do tricks, and he didn't get a treat. Oh, he's, he's really thinking that he wants some crickets. The bone you... here would be huge. Okay, good. So you think he'd like the flour? Well, yeah, flour doesn't have the chili food. lime. Right. Oh, yeah, the flour doesn't... Mm. Are you trying the flour now, too? Yeah, I think you, you're, you're addicted to this stuff. It's actually good. The flour, you're right. I think the flavor, the chili lime, was the flavor you were tasting. Here, have some flour. I don't, I don't, I don't, well, I got, now I got bone bits all over my hands. Um, here, uh, toaster. toaster. Hey, go, have go, some flour. Go over here. See if he likes that. 
Oh, yeah, see? Oh, look. Oh. Did he lick it? Oh, yeah. Oh, he loves it. I think it was the chili lime. Yeah, it was the chili lime. Yeah. Okay, here's yeah. a bone Give for him a bone. Bud. He'll be happy. This is very exciting, Andrew. So at what stage are you? Are you your early stage startup at this point, or are you actually starting to do big production? Yeah, so uh, where I'm sitting right now is our R&D pilot farm. Uh, we're in a small warehouse space. Uh, we've been working for the last year getting the core production system really running smoothly, uh, efficiently getting all the you know processes in line. Our next step that hopefully we'll be able to break ground on later this year is a full commercial scale farm. Uh, that will be producing. How know, what, is that thousands. acres? How big is a bug farm? In you know, thousands to tens of thousands of square feet, wow. as opposed to acres. And you would do that? Uh, do they need light, sunlight? You would do that in a in a warehouse, or? Yeah, they need just you know a little bit of light for their normal cycle, but that right. can be any overhead light. Artificial, LEDs. okay. Yes. Wow. I'm. It's, I mean, look at this. Is this is. We need to solve the the world food crisis. Absolutely. There are people starving. This and this is a perfectly high protein, delicious treat. I love this idea, and it's a lot more economical than growing wheat, right? What is the what is that uh, scale you were talking about? Uh, the trophic scale. Trophic uh, scale for conversion? for wheat. Yeah. Well, so wheat is uh, at the bottom, so it's just one to one. It's you really know, it's cheap. Sun. Okay, so we, yeah. why would you use this for flour if it's if it's more expensive? So you'd use it instead of eating other animal proteins. Oh, because uh, you need animal protein. Yeah. Got it. So you yeah. get the so animal you've got protein. All the good amino acids. You've got your. Is it a complete? An is it a complete protein? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's oh. got uh, animal-only amino acids like lysine and taurine that are hard to get from plant sources. Okay. And it's probably low glycemic as well, so you're not going to get it. Oh, big sure. Depth. It's all protein, right? There's no sugar in this. Yeah. No. Yeah. In fact, there's even a little fiber. The exoskeleton is chitin. It digests <laughs> like fiber. The exoskeleton, that's what I was tasting. Mm, yeah. It's crunchy and delicious. Yeah. Um, could I live on this? <laughs> yeah. Like, this is like yeah, a, you, you a complete protein. Too. All right, well, yeah. you want some vegetables, a little broccoli on the side. But yeah, this could absolutely. be my, this could substitute for meat in a normal diet. Absolutely. I'm very interested. You making the switch? How about, yeah, maybe. It's not exactly vegetarian. I mean, that's still an animal. That you're eating it's just a small animal with yeah, what an would that be it's not pescatarian <laughs> it's bugatarian it's like cricketarian cricketarian sure exo i can't wait to go to a party and say oh i'm sorry i'm, I'm, I'm cricketarian do you have anything made of crickets <laughs> yeah uh I, uh antiquarian antiquarian Ant like entomology antiquarian i think you're right i think that's it andrew i'm very excited where is tiny farm located we're in uh, San Leandro, so we're just oh, south just of Oakland. Road. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm being told there are other flavors besides chili lime. What other flavors? Uh, we can put any flavor you like on there. We can do <laughs> salt, barbecue, you know, sriracha, whatever you want. This is not the product, though. I wish it were, because you know what? Yeah. We're, we're looking at productizing that. I would. Yes. They're fabulous. What do you, what do you fry them in? Uh, right now, canola oil. Okay. Well, I'm not doing any more. <laughs> I would do the flour. I, I would do the flour. I do do. The, I think it's the neutral. Flour doesn't it's have fine. any flavor really at all. It tastes almost. It's rich. It's nice. And look at toaster loves the flour. Look at that. He that's, does love the that's flour. That's like meat for him. That's good. He loves that. He's going for the other finger. <laughs> he wants it all. He loves it. Hey, it's great to talk to you, Andrew. Congratulations. I think this is a great idea, great startup. I wish you all the best. Thank you. It was and fun talking to you guys. Thanks for the crickets. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Wow. Enjoy them. Take care. <sighs> you just went all in on that segment. <laughs> You're just... good. You're really good. <laughs> I'm so excited. Doesn't it smell good? It oh, smells I like think... emoji in here. Mm. <laughs> it smells like cooking emoji. So... How do you make a cheeseburger? Do you do it as Apple does with bun, tomato, cheese, patty, lettuce, bun? Lettuce on the bottom? That's weird. No. Do you do it as Facebook does? This is the normal way. Bun, lettuce, tomato. Now that's wrong too. Cheese, patty, bun. I do it bun, lettuce, no, bun, tomato, lettuce. Che These are all the different cheeseburger emojis. I think Twitter has it right. Twitter, let's look at Twitter. Where is Twitter? 
but that's there not it one is. of our choices. Yes, that's the way I do it. That's the normal way. Sesame seed bun, although it's a, per, it's a paucity of sesame seeds. Sesame seed bun, tomatoes, lettuce, cheeseburger bun. That's the correct way to do it, in my opinion. But as you look at Google, look closely at Google, please, because it's, it's, a, it's messed up. Google, don't be evil, except in the... Bun, lettuce... Cheese on the bottom. Tomato, that's wrong to begin with. Then the bun, then the burger, then the cheese? By this all started, by the way, with this tweet, Thomas Baikdal, who says, I think, I think we need to have a discussion about how Google's burger emoji is placing the cheese underneath the burger while Apple puts it on top. That, by the way, then led to CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, tweeting, we're going to get on this on Monday if the internet can agree what's right. Then somebody pointed out, have you seen the Google beer emoji? Oh, no, yeah, the, the beer foam, goes foam. halfway up the, the mug, stops, and then there's a foam head. Yeah. There's a air gap. <laughs> Google, who's, are they, what are they doing? Who's doing their emojis? Know. Anyway, we thought there's one way to solve this. See? <coughs> what the heck is that? It's like they don't <laughs> even understand how beer works. They're aliens. It's, I don't think they come from this planet. Alcohol. <laughs> they don't drink alcohol or eat yeah. cheeseburgers, apparently. I guess not. So what we've... This is crazy. This is... I, by the way, I picked a bad day to fast. I wasn't going to eat today, but we've got to do a taste test. So We have to. Science. So Colleen is here. She is our uh, senior uh, producer type person, <laughs> supervising producer. What do you do here? I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> Everything. So Sundar's it, waiting for you to weigh in. So we have to so, weigh in. Right. So here, Thank have you. a... Oh, uh, oh, have okay. a uh, okay. So we're going to put these googly eyes on so right. we can't see... That's right. The, the order of the stuff and we're going to do a taste test okay we're going to do the facebook the google and the apple way but we won't know we won't know we won't know uh and then what okay. and then we will just say which one we like better okay. right exactly yes okay. all right so you everyone at home can see which one it is that's perfect and then megan i'm going to hand you one. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. there it <laughs> is <laughs> megan no, is that you no, this is for you Leo. <laughs> Okay. Turn your hand over. Okay, there's no plate, oh, by the I've way. Given, there's no plate. I've, I've been handed a burger. A napkin. By the way, be careful how you touch it because you could feel where the lettuce is. So don't oh, touch okay. too much in the right. middle, right? Good right. job. When do, we, when do we eat? Okay, and where's one, my mouth? Two, three, <laughs> go. Taste it. I can't find my mouth. <laughs> you're, doing, mm. you're holding it upside down, Leo. Mm. Oh, oh, should I hold it right side up? Does that matter? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there cheese on this at all? <laughs> you can eat as much as you like, oh. but just know that you have to eat two more, so or taste two more. Okay. I think this is cheese. Should I say it out loud? No. What should we do? It's delicious. So you hey. tell me what you think, which one you think it is, and we'll decide. Everybody at home knows which one you're tasting, and now you have to identify the one that you think you're tasting, and we'll decide. Tell us the order. Cheese, tomato, burger, lettuce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's not bad. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all I know is it's delicious. Okay. Oh, okay. okay, all right, we'll put that one I'm back. A, I have to say something, though, don't I? I think that is the Facebook one. Okay. So, we'll go like this. <laughs> still Megan? my shoulder. Still is my that you? Shoulder. Is that you, Megan? Okay. Still my shoulder. All right, so now we're going to move on to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> Oh, you took the burger away. I did. Very superstitious. <laughs> okay, so no, here's the, the next one. All right. Okay, perfect. Mm. All right. I'm holding my hand. Please, <laughs> sir, can I have some more? There we go. Okay, more. here we go. There more you go, burger. Okay. There's a ham. Oh, now you give me a napkin. I gave you a napkin because oh, I think you're you? right. I had a napkin Genteel. before. Genteel. I didn't have one before, but I'm a very tidy Okay, eater. <laughs> there we go. All right. Taste I don't know how I need to use the napkin. I can't find my mouth. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> First of all, I think based on the sesame seeds. Oh, sesame. There's no sesame seeds on this. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> You've got them too, Megan. Uh, I think I dropped some on my dress. <laughs> and it feels... What is that? Okay. This one, Okay. the burger's definitely on the bottom. Oh, I'm not supposed to touch it with my hand. I'm just supposed um, to. So this is, so what is it? Facebook, Google, and Apple? Uh-huh. It's an Apple burger. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So by the process of elimination. You can tell by the OLED screen. Yeah. 
All right, Megan, what's your no guess? no finger ID. Which one do you think it is? This one is definitely um, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's <laughs> not in a bunch. We're not doing Twitter. Google. Oh, okay. Ooh. So you think that's the one with the cheese on the bottom, mm -hmm, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm. I can feel it with my mm. mouth. You know what? These are very good burgers. I must say, these are delicious. Mm -hmm. Is this Nyman Ranch beef? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, very tasty. It's a beast burger. It's a Kobe, beast Kobe burger. Kobe mm. Okay. Mm. All I right, think it might be made out of one buffalo. One more. Mm -mm. I was promised this wasn't made from an animal. Please, sir. Yes, okay. you're a Pescovo Gategarian, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You don't eat eggs or cheese. I think this is probably our best episode yet. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good for us. I never got to eat on the show. This mm. is great. Okay, Leo. Have we ever final? done a taste test on the show before? I don't think so. I got to eat the Impossible Burger. I'm so jealous. I still haven't had one of those. All right. Okay, Megan, this is for you. So this is, by process of elimination, if I was correct on the other ones, this is the Google Burger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, there are four ways that you can get energy on the <laughs> earth. Right. Um. I'll be honest with you. Can I be honest with you? Mm -hmm. I don't taste cheese on any of them. Mm. You think they're punking us? Mm, no. Oh. My last one had cheese on the bottom. This one is... Can you use stronger cheese next time? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Mm. My problem is I haven't eaten anything in days, so it all well, tastes that's probably fabulous. Better. Mm. Mm. What's the order, do you think? I think this is lettuce, tomato. I can't tell at all. Patty. No, wait. Lettuce, Can tomato, I lick it? cheese, patty. Oh, I figured out how to do this. You just lick it. <laughs> I had cheese on it. I had a say. I had a say. I had a say. Okay, where's the other one? Here's another one. Oh, see, I need, to, I need to go back in time. Okay, there Wait, that's it, right? Go. That's it. Those are the three. I can't tell the difference. Can you tell the difference? Mm. Okay. Oh, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's your guess, Megan? For the final one, Apple, Google, or Facebook? Apple, Apple. That's not really germane. What's germane is which one tasted the best. Well, that's what we'll do afterwards. At the end, oh, we'll decide. I have to remember that too. All mm -hmm. right. Okay, let me take another bite of this one. This one was pretty good. I like the first one. Whatever the first one is, that's how you should make your cheeseburgers from now on. Mm -hmm. so, I like this one the best. Okay, right. Apple. Can we take off these blindfolds? Yeah, Leah, which one do you think the last one was? Well, there was one left. It was Google, according oh, okay. to my previous. Because, okay. you know, there's only three, sure. right? You should have thrown in a, a fourth mm. mystery. A mystery burger? Um, what about the battery life? <laughs> How do they feel in the hand? The hand feel? <laughs> How does the hand feel? Mm -hmm. How do they feel in the hand? Mm -hmm. Which would you choose? Megan, is that you? <laughs> tell me. Tell me. <laughs> Um, which would I don't you know why, that your... cracks me up. Yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. why either. All right. Well, I think we have a winner. Uh-oh, is it All Megan? All right, time to take those off. Let's okay. see. Whoa. <laughs> I, mean, I got them all wrong. <laughs> all wrong. I got them all wrong. You got the one right. I mean, oh quite my God. the mess. You, you, you were, cor you were mess? correct. <laughs> wow. Um, I couldn't, I'll be honest with you, right, I couldn't see? tell where the cheese was. Now, which one was best? I thought the first one was best. Um, the first one was Apple. Apple. The first one oh. was Apple. Oh. Apple makes it almost right. And there you can see this one the was good, cheese yeah. on the bottom. And that made it hard, too, because then the, the lettuce and the top bun are sliding off because there's nothing mm -hmm. to ground them mm -hmm. to the bun. Oh, that's an interesting problem. Mm -hmm. That's what we were having that problem with. The last one fell apart. The last one was Facebook's? Yeah. So the Facebook way is a bad way, because there's no adhesive. That's right. probably what they're saying in their Senate hearings as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Russians made this one. <clears throat> well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I have to tell you, those cheeseburgers tasted good when we started that segment. But by the time <laughs> we ended it, they were not so good. They were kind of cold.
All right, coming up next, uh, this, this actually is a very exciting segment and a cool one too. And it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but the man we're about to meet is the son of an old friend who works at Lawrence Livermore Lab. We met a man who's repurposing your old smartphones to save the rainforest. We'll also see how autonomous tech is now bringing you room service. Watch. We're going to say hi to Topher White. He's hey guys. with the Rainforest Connection. I know the Rainforest Connection. Hey. That's a great That's organization. Thank you. Uh, you're trying to save the rainforest, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. The rainforest, forests all over the place. Deforestation um, is the number one cause of climate change. Uh, number two, but uh, that definitely counts. What's number one? Cow uh, farts. Energy, <laughs> in general. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Energy in general. <laughs> but, yeah. I would, I, I, actually, I've been talking to the Rainforest Connection since they first started. I remember they told me it's the three C's. It's chains, mm -hmm. chainsaws, cows, and cars, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's, uh, it's, it's roads. So in our case, we're saying that, look, if, if it's the second largest contributor to climate change, almost 20% of all the carbon every year comes from deforestation, it's actually the roads that are the cause of that, and logging is what causes the, the roads. The roads into the forest yeah. so they could take the trees out. Yeah, because logging is the most uh, lucrative one, So though, and 90% of logging in the rainforest is illegal. So if you can actually stop that, which is a mandate to do, because it's illegal, then you can have a big impact So outside. how did you come up with this idea? Uh, this all kind of started because I went to Indonesia as, uh, as a volunteer at a Gibbon Reserve. Uh, actually, here's an image of this right here. Uh, and this one place that I visited was, um, was just kind of actually spending all their time trying to oh. protect the outskirts of this, uh, this reserve from logging and realized that they had cell phone service out there. They had like no electricity, no running what? water, no roads. But they have cell service? It's cell service uh, in the jungle. There's no roads out there, you know, no, no running water. You no see this stuff. a lot because it's easy yeah. to do infrastructure that's wireless. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the interesting things about this is I've been hearing about this since I was a child. Mm -hmm. deforestation, the deforestation is happening and all of the, the organizations that formed were about dealing with the consequences, like this, you know, mm -hmm. finding the animals and making sure that they were safe and, and perhaps trying to cut down in the amount of illegal logging but we haven't really had the technology or the political will to do something about actually stopping. Well, it's, now it's we true. have the laws. We just need the. We need somebody out there watching. Is what that, we need. Yeah, it's a big place. Well, no, I mean, it's it's it, the, the laws give us a mandate, not us even. The people on the ground. There's people there who would stop it if they knew where it was and if they knew they had support. So you're saying loggers kind of basically sneak in? And uh, so they don't have to sneak in. They drive in with big old trucks, <laughs> you know. Uh, and but there's no one. That, it's a it's a empty space. It is. So where space, is this yeah. thing you built? Oh yeah. So basically, this is the, uh, this this is the idea. Love. This is look uh, at this. Well, yeah, the whole idea. So basically, uh, it has to be solar powered, right? Because we take these old phones, we put them up in trees, they listen to all the sounds of the forest, and they can pick out the sounds of chainsaws uh, and logging trucks and things like that. Uh, here's a kind of a dramatization of it all if you ever want to see it. So you're and actually, these are listening devices. And it, you know, picks up the sound and- But they're so high up that the, the loggers aren't aware of them. Uh, that is correct, yeah. I mean, it's hard to see stuff up in a tree. Um, Especially if it's shaped it like, like this, because yeah. it, it just looks like another set of leaves, basically. <laughs> Pretty Father much. Robert but came inside. in the room and he looked at it and said, oh, <laughs> yeah. What did you say? You said you knew me, like, because you're a maker. I, I, I thought it was a solar powered en environmental sensor. But look, see, so sort of is. Yeah. It, it, well, look, we can do some pretty high end stuff, right? So, because there's cell phone networks, there's no reason for us to build some super high end piece of technology because there's 150 million cell phones thrown away every year. And nobody wants so that cell phone. phone right? yeah, this, is, this is like uh, maybe an Android phone from 2007, yeah. Huawei. Yeah. Uh, but the funny thing is that it's so simple to put together. You know, um, you can sort of see another anima animation of that over here. So you but have power and you have audio. Uh, you sort of connect together. to the microphone jack, right? Uh, do you run and you run Mr. some custom software on it? Oh yeah, we just yeah we run an app on there that runs uh, and it streams up to the cloud and we can use AI to, to pull it out. But like the funny thing is that this is pretty easy to put together. This this one here was put together by a guy named Lucas in a, in a school. And Lucas is uh, is like nine years old. Oh this my phone is God. ten years old. I thought that was kind of funny. The old phone is older than the, <laughs> the phone the, is older than the kids. And it's three D so. printed parts. Uh, yeah, we use like basically the whole idea is we want to be able to use stuff that they can assemble there in the field. Like we're never going to save a ton of rainforest if we're the ones building it and sending it out there. So that's why we use old phones. That's why we use these boxes. How many do you want to get out there? Oh, I mean, um, well, it doesn't take that much actually. So. The thing with sound is that you can pick up sounds of chainsaws from, you know, a kilometer away, right? Or, you know, also through, that's half a mile. Yeah. And so, you know, we have some of these things up in, uh, in sort of, you know, at roads, at perimeter. So just a few dozen can protect thousands of square miles if you have people to respond. And I love this design. Idea. So we've got this. How much, how much voltage, how much power can this create, this solar panel create? Uh, this is, an, well, these things actually, because we stream all the audio to the cloud, they have to create a lot. So this is, uh, this is actually, we have to generate about 40 uh, watt hours per 24 hour so period. So 40 watt hours. And then inside that box, you've got some sort of converter to get that down to five volts. I'm yep. betting you have a bunch of 18650 cells in there that just convert uh, it into the power. You got it. Actually, we're, well, this is sort of the uh, older version. We got another one over here. Oh, it's over here somewhere. We're, we're switching to a new battery technology, actually. So those are 26650s. But, yeah. Ooh, okay. but we're actually Ooh. switching to lithium iron phosphate.
Lithium ion uh, phosphate. Yeah, it's going to give you more recharge cycles. And more recharge cycles. Nice. It's more environmentally friendly. Uh, we don't want to put up situations where a battery could, you know, combust in a tree. That kind of defeats the purpose. Oh yeah. But that uh, would be good. but no, in general, that's just the idea is that we can we want these things to last for years. They're like satellites, but they're working How really hard. How high up does this have to be? It doesn't to, have to, to get, be that high. Because, I mean, well, it has to be in the middle the of the canopy, canopy though, right. right? To get the sun? In the canopy. So that's why you have really? this bizarre design, right? So these are actually recycled, uh, you know, um, shards that we get from a partner down in Santa Clara. So um, those aren't even new. Those are these recycled. These aren't even new. Well, they're not actually recycled, so they're like cutoffs from these high end panels right. on backpacks and things like that. Oh, I get it. They're just yeah. extra. There's extra. And then we can solder these things together and cut it out. And, you know, this is still kind of. That's a great idea. High end. <laughs> it really is. But, uh, no, at the end of the day, we I think that. There's no reason for us to be building the hardware. Like, how we're going to really scale is that people out there are already on their second or third generation phones. They're going to be able to put these things together themselves. Phones will get more environmentally, uh, you know, stable and environmentally uh, um, So you, you want, know, resilient. So you want people like, what was his name, Lucas? You want him to download plans for this? How, how, can, how can people get involved? Well, so, I mean, at the moment, the big thing for us is that the hardware, you can do a lot with, uh, with not that much hardware, right? So uh, we really want to focus on the software side of things. We're a tech company. We're going to try and find a way we can be scalable. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, conservation can be as simple as uh, somebody sort of downloading an app out from the field and then putting a phone on a tree themselves. But that means that the way we want people to be involved is by downloading the apps here and, and getting into it. You mentioned earlier that the narrative hasn't really changed in like yeah. 30 years, you know? And I think that's because there's not a lot of originality when it comes to how to stop, uh, stop this stuff. And the only way we can make the rainforest persist and survive is if people here are able to care about it. But what we care about has changed over the past 20 years. Right. It has to be immediate. And so the same way we can send alerts to people on the ground, we can send alerts to people here. You can get an alert when a chainsaw goes off. We can tell you when a monkey goes through the forest. You can connect to the okay, forest we, in real time. We have to talk about that. Okay, so yeah. I, I, I like the tech. I, yeah. I love putting stuff like this together. But yeah. the big question is, what do I get out of this? So I've put, I've put an old cell phone up 100, 150 feet up into the canopy. Yeah. It's now connected to the cellular network. Mm -hmm. What am I getting and what can I do with it? Okay, so at this point, it's now streaming audio up into the cloud. We're analyzing it for anything, mostly chainsaws, logging trucks, but really any species you're looking for, there's an AI model that's going to help pick that out over time. So it's not just logging. I can not actually, just what, a machine learning to pick out individual species? Sure, and right now it's just <laughs> a few species, but we're going to make it hopefully very easy over the next few months for even ecologists to be able to sort of add species to it, and that can scale out across the whole system. So the idea behind it is that if you want to, if you want to get people to care about the forest, we have to turn the forest into a real experience for them. And that's not going to come from, you know, telling them all the bad news and the rest. It's about them actually having a personalized connection to what's there. Well, to that end, you've got a VR app. Yeah, hey, that's that's kind of the idea. Let's, so let's get our daydream on here. So right? I mean, do, do we have the daydreams? Oh no, we'll just do it on the. Uh, we could show it on the Apple TV. Oh yeah, hey, cool. So, so hey, Rainforest Connection. I mean, basically every phone you put up there. Uh, you can uh, so here, anyone can download this app, right? Yeah, now. it's on the App Store. It's called Search uh, for Rainforest iOS Connection. iOS and Android, or iOS, iOS and Android. So uh, what's it called? For. Search. It's called uh, Rainforest Connection. Rainforest Connection. So search, search for Rainforest, Rainforest Connection. Yeah, and so the whole idea behind this go. is that every phone you put up there, yes, it's sending alerts. Wait a minute, where is that? That's in. This is Brazil. Brazil. So this is a live stream coming out of Brazil. Uh, Audio stream with an old phone, basically a phone like this, oh, uh, up, in the, up in, up the, up in the trees. We should say the phone doesn't stream live video only because that would be a huge amount of bandwidth. So yeah. this is a still picture. Yeah. But that's real-time audio. It's real-time audio, and that's what's being analyzed for all the stuff. So this is actually in a very dangerous area. This is a tree in a, in a Tembe reserve in Brazil, where this tribe is actually more or less taking back their area um, militantly from um, from illegal loggers and drug cartels. Uh, and so this is, whenever there's a truck that goes by, they get an alert, and then um, they're able oh. to respond in real time. So you're, you're alerting the tribe? They're alerting the tribe, yeah. I, um, I would assume that an internal combustion engine or a chainsaw makes a very distinctive sound. Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know a chainsaw yeah. does. You it can does. hear those a mile And so away. this tribe, I mean, it's a really amazing story. But this is the, kind of the whole principle, right, is that if we want to save the rainforest, it's not going to be us to go out there and do it. There's people there who would do it. These tribes are amazing. This guy, this guy here, this is the... Uh, is the Tembe warrior who, uh, who was able to sort of, um, they're responding to, uh, to alerts on a, on a regular basis. I want to stay says, right on to this guy. That is oh, awesome. No, but check this out. So like these, these guys there, if we want to fight wow. climate change, we're always thinking about energy. You know, we're thinking about how we can like, cut right. down our energy footprint, which is important. But there's people out there in the field where they can have a bigger impact on affecting climate change than, you know, dozen engineers at Tesla. Yeah. Just because they have the, that much in front of them. If we can just build small, pretty unimpressive technical tools to make a difference. Now, who pays for the for bandwidth on this? I mean... Uh, well, it's actually not that not that bad. Uh, I have to really give a shout out to T-Mobile. Uh, they they aren't philanthropically helping us, but I got to tell you that sort of unlimited um, that unlimited international <laughs> it works data everywhere. Plan <laughs> is pretty great. That's for, what I uh, use. Streaming things out of the forest. Yeah. So um, save uh, save rainforest as you go plan. It's true. Uh, <laughs> it's throttled, so it's not great for uh, for streaming video, but we're streaming audio, so no worries. You know, yeah, 2G is plenty for yeah, audio. Yeah, audio stream is it's what 13k maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, no, it's even less than that. So I think it's, uh, we're assuming maybe like two or three kilobytes a second. Oh, gee. Um, it's perfect. Yeah, and get it out so there. So how many of these are out there? Uh, so at the moment, there are a little less than 70 out there in the field, but that's enough for us to protect what we think is uh, between three and 4,000 uh, square kilometers of Holy force. cow. Um, and you want to get more out? Is there any way we oh, can totally. help? How can we Yeah, help? I mean, I think that uh, it's all about sort of being able to listen in. We want to build a community around it, um, and we want to sort of get into it. And another thing on top of that is that, look, if we have this system that allows you to pick out insights from the forest, we want people to be able to grab that, like ecologists, biologists, and the rest. And we're also going to release an app, hopefully, uh, early next year that allows anybody to take this and put this on their windowsill. And they can oh. actually get a, an alert when their favorite bird comes into the backyard oh. or the other sorts of things happen. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, once you've got the technology, you can expand this incredibly. I mean, kind of, you can you <laughs> start uh, categorizing city sounds. This is like a ring yeah. doorbell for the forest. That's yeah. a really great idea. I love <laughs> that. Certain sense. So, um, uh, can we, yeah. What's the website? How uh, can we website, help? What can uh, we do? RFCX.org, but really just, uh, I think that the, just go on the App Store, I, iOS app. or Android, and, and download the app. Uh, that'll be the great way for us to stay in contact. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, Look guys. for Rainforest Connection. Yeah, hey. RFCX. There we are. We got, we're going to get into some really org. cool stuff, I think. This um, combines so many things that this network loves. The fact that you're reusing old technology, keeping mm -hmm. it out of landfills, the fact that you've created something new, the fact that you're helping the environment, and the fact that, I like this, you are giving people a tool to defend their homes. I love uh, it. Seriously. And, and you know, when they do that, How inspiring. they're, they're yeah. inspired to do it anyway. If, they, if they're doing that, they're helping us. They're doing the job right. for us when it comes to climate change. I mean, Did you have help designing this? How, who, who, tell me about your, the team involved. Uh, so the team involved is, uh, is fantastic. We're mostly working on some really uh, cool cloud-based technologies for, uh, for helping to... Um, to you, you know, must have AI people insights. and Yeah, we got, a, we got a good team of AI people, but we realized pretty early on that we couldn't be hiring more data scientists to build more models to pick out new things. So that's why we sort of made a choice that just like having phones in trees to make it so rangers don't have to go out there and find things, we have to build a system that allows us to automate the detection of new species. Yeah, yeah. And so that's really what we're working on. But uh, we're focused on ways that anyone can get involved. Uh, the rainforest will only be saved if we can make the rainforest interesting to the world. And that's what this app's about. That's what the rest of this is all about. So uh, we think that it's going to be that connection between the people in the field who are doing this great work and the people here. But that's not going to happen naturally. It's up to us to, to, to sort of incentivize people to, to care. Uh, and that's what uh, this real-time connection is all about. Very nice. Topher, really great thanks, to guys. meet you. rfcx.org. Hey, thanks a lot, Keep you guys. up the great work. Wow. Hey. This is it's everything we we're interested this in is in us. every respect. This is what we do. I love it. <laughs> uh, you guys talk about everything that we're interested in. <laughs> <laughs>and so we looked at all the different places where delivery uh, would be useful and we found that there are many many possible places where this could be helpful and hotels were one of the obvious uh, markets so right now about how many uh, relays are deployed and are they just in hotels or are they in other places as well we are actually in many properties right now uh, we have over say fifth let's see over 50 signed contracts um, about half of those are, have already been installed and are in service. Uh, most of those are hotels, but we're also looking at other industries as well. We just announced a partnership with FedEx, actually, and they have seven of our robots, and they're doing deliveries inside of a repair center. And so relays being used in many, many different kinds of applications to move things around. So uh, help me place Savvy Oak in the broader context of robotics and what things look like. Is there kind of a wave of other companies that you all are part of, or do you feel a little bit lonely sometimes, as though you're, you know, only a handful of folks are doing this, or what is that kind of broader scene for 
companies who are competing against you or complementary? So I think there's a, there's a growing number of robotics companies right now, and that's great because you know this year is really going to be the year of the robots. Um, but I, I do know that when we started, um, the space was a lot uh, less full of, of other robotics companies. There were uh, robotics for the home, such as Roomba, you know, vacuum cleaners, and there were robotics for industry, um, you know, big industrial robot arms that build cars. And there wasn't much in between, which we thought was the sweet spot. And so right in the middle is where you get the robots for structured environments, semi-structured environments, like hotels or like hospitals, where it's uh, more structured than a home. You know, it's less messy and it's kept clean and neat. And it's, but it's less structured than a factory or a, a warehouse where everything's very rigidly controlled. Lau and her team envision a future where robots assist humans for specific tasks and largely do jobs that can help make us more efficient, rather than simply replacing us in the workforce. Back at the Aloft location in Newark, California, their relay robot has proven indispensable. He's just not a novelty. Um, he's actually helpful to the hotel. Bottler allows us to take that 15 minute time standard that was standard in all hotels, bring that down to two and a half minutes, and let us communicate with our guests in a much more timelier manner. Maybe it's because we're in Silicon Valley, but we noticed that people don't seem to find it all that surprising that a robot is cruising around Aloft's hallways alone and on its own. Our ability to find these robots so friendly is no mistake. We want to make sure that Relay was never perceived as something that would cause anxiety or creepiness for the people that are around it. And one of the things that we discovered early on in our design research is that if a, ro if a robot can communicate as well as we can, at least to some degree, then you, you evaporate a lot of that concern. So Relay has a speech bubble where he's always disclosing what he's up to. And actually, he, when he's idle, he says who he is, how he can help, and when he's on a task, he says that he's on a delivery. Just that speech bubble saying those few words demystifies what's going on with our robot. Um, and then having the eyes on the robot is to add a layer of empathy because we rely on humans to complete our tasks. So when he's getting into an elevator, we hope that people see this cute robot and want to step aside to let him in because it's really up to everybody to make this thing work out. So we are still kind of really in the early days of robotics as yeah. a whole, right? Even though corporations, you know, manufacturing facilities, they've been using for a long time. Mm -hmm. Where this is all going, you know, there's obviously different ideas like the Rosie idea and the Terminator idea. Um, what do you <laughs> say to people when they ask you, like, is this the beginning of the robot apocalypse? Or are you gonna like, you know, ruin the planet and take all the jobs or that, that kind of doomsday scenario? As long as good people are creating helpful tools to make people's lives better, that's the position we've got. We want to improve people's lives with the products we make, especially with the robots we make. You know, anything can happen, but we're confident that uh, what you see coming out today is an indicator of where we're going. And it's a lot of robots that are assistive devices to extend the capabilities of people. So we firmly believe by setting a good precedent and by seeing what the community is up to, we fundamentally think that things are going to work out to our benefit in the future. It will mix things up, but we like to think in a really great way. We've been spending a the last couple of years really talking about uh, VR at Twit, uh, and uh, with mixed results. I'm uh, still a VR skeptic, but there are two areas where VR really works. First, we're gonna go to nomadic VR, where they mix the real world with the virtual world for a very fun tactile experience, and then we're going to take you out of body with a ride on a VR roller coaster watch. You'd think I'd never put on a backpack before. How's that feel? Good. All right. The green light just came on. That's your cue to enter the office. Here we go. Let's see here. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> I need you to check the security monitor above the desk. Something's going down. Get the gun in the filing cabinet uh, next to the desk. That is cool. I want some pizza, but not that pizza. Okay. Yeah, it's got a flashlight on it. That's nifty. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> oh my god, this is totally weird. Watch out! There's a drone below you. Ugh. Oh. Ugh. 
I got a curl. My heart is actually really beating very fast right now. <laughs> that was awesome. That was so cool. Thanks for, man, letting us walk through this experience because I have to tell you, it was an entirely different world experience from any VR experience I've experienced. Well, it's great to have you here. We're yeah. uh, really excited about what we're doing. You know, back when film first burst onto the scene and that train came at them, people felt like it was real. Now we're moving into this interactive element of virtual mm -hmm. reality. Maybe people are a little uh, disappointed after a few years of hype around VR because it's not quite as immersive, but what you're doing with Nomadic really takes it to the next level. Explain your um, kind of what you're bringing to the table here to take Nomadic into that super, that hyper physical uh, direction. Well, one of the problems I've always had with VR in the past is that when you're si when you're sitting still or you can only move around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't really explore, and so you're forced to use controllers and things right. to like leap forward or you know do things, grab things, whatever. And we really wanted to take away all that so that your body was your controller, just like in the real world. When you need to open the door, you reach out, you grab the door handle, you turn it, you open the door, you walk through it. And so we're trying to take every little bit of <laughs> tricks and, and that I learned over the years in, in the film industry of how can you convince people that that uh, the visuals are real by giving them something to touch, by giving them uh, vibrations and wind and heat. It creates this, what we call in the film industry, suspension of disbelief. I wasn't expecting the, the realism. <laughs> For me, as a, as a game maker, you know, I've never really had to think about what the physical position is of the player. But in our experience, for example, we have a situation where one of the NPCs asks you to wave. Hi. Right? They wave at you. Oh, I see you. Okay, hi. And we actually don't track you. We just sort of assume like social obligation will take over and you wave back. And everyone does. This is really right? cool. Right? Because you don't want to be that guy. Right? The guy <laughs> waves you, you wave back. And it's a little subtle thing, but it all adds up into this larger feeling of I'm really here. The wind, the heat the physicality, the different textures, right? The way the plank kind of wobbles yeah. when you walk the across The floor it. underneath you is a big aspect yeah, of this particular experience, right. be it the plank, be it the elevator. Right, Having have an actual prop in your hand. Oh, you know, if man. you don't know where you are in the space, it can be a real challenge, but if you have a prop, your body kind of fills in the dots. Do you have uh, plans or ideas around expanding it so you do see more physical elements, or is that a big kind of, uh, I don't know, a big challenge? It is a big challenge, but the answer to the question is yes. We absolutely want to get to an avatar-style representation in space. And we have done it with, for example, we've, we've done it with Leap Motion, which is a, for folks who don't know, it's a hand-tracking software and hardware solution. And to, to have your hands is certainly a bonus. So we do know that being able to see your hands and to do finger tracking, that's great. But also really for multiplayer. We know that having that social element just adds so much more engagement and you're so much more enthralled when you can share it with another person. So we're gonna get to multiplayer and all the, and all the challenges that come along with that is you need to see where the other person is. Absolutely. You know, and, and just a floating headset and a floating gun isn't gonna do it. I imagine user testing is of high importance when you're talking about stuff like this. And sure. I know that you guys were in Hong Kong uh, yep. not too long ago doing doing a lot of user testing there. What are some of the surprises that you gleaned from watching <laughs> people go through your env the environment that you have created around them? Well, it's really fascinating watching human behavior because, yeah. first of all, people are essentially blindfolded when they're going through it. And so they are just <laughs> reacting. They're not aware that there's chaperones and stuff that are following them Thanks. through just to make sure that they're you know not going to fall and trip or get hurt. Um, but we can watch their behavior and, and it gives us A, feedback so that we can correct the game. Like if people are consistently doing something or having trouble with something, we can fix it. But also it's really fascinating to watch how people deal with things. We had some folks, I think they were from uh, from Russia, and I'm not sure if it was a, a translation issue, but rather than going to the window, they were trying to climb through the window. <laughs> <laughs> a big part of what Nomadic is doing in this location-based VR is not necessarily the general idea of here's a big warehouse, you come here, it's the same experience every time you go through. Right. It's meant to be more of a modular approach. Explain a little bit about like how is that built into a location? Yeah, we're trying to make it like going to the movies mm -hmm. so that uh, Every few months, a new experience comes into town. And if it's a really popular one, it can get, get into a rotation and keep coming back. But our, our experiences are designed so that uh, we have modular set pieces, modular wall pieces, modular props. Everything is designed so that it can be quickly reconfigured so that uh, our locations have as little downtime as possible. So that we can come in overnight, 
rearrange the walls, put in new set pieces, load new software, and you have a whole new experience the next day. Yeah, I can see so many kind of possibilities around tie-ins with movies. You know, you go see you go see a movie like Mission Impossible, sure. and before or after the movie, go in there and have the Mission Impossible experience and tie it in with your movie right. viewing experience. And the visuals can be anything you want. It could be Mission Impossible, it could be Avatar, it could be Dora the Explorer, it could be uh, Legos. I mean, it could be uh, any of these things. Surprise is important, and there are a lot of different kind of surprises. The, the easy ones are the startling stuff, the shock scares, and we, we really decided long ago it's easy to mess that up and do that poorly. Um, and I think the VR industry in general, the home industry, is, is starting to learn. There have been some horror games that have been really kind of traumatic to some people. I kind of mm -hmm. overdid it. Um, and, you know, we're seeing much more sophisticated sort of psychological horror that's coming along in, in the home scene. We will likely do haunted house style scenarios. I don't know if we're ever going to go down that route of uh, more of a, a tougher horror experience just because it, I don't think it fits the kind of audience that we're going for. So those kind of surprises um, we're not going to aim for. But the other kind of surprises, surprises that can be done around things like changing of scale really quickly. That's something you can do beautifully in VR where suddenly you know, you're know you a six foot tall human being and very easily you can be a six inch mouse really quickly. And suddenly oh, the world yeah. looks really different to you, yeah. right? And so this thing that you're interacting with that was, you know, you thought was a trash can a minute ago is now a thimble and you're just like, whoa, what is going on? But it's like, it's still just a trash can, dude. You recent, very recently kind of came out of stealth mm -hmm. mode, and uh, you know, now everybody's kind of getting the chance to, you know, you're inviting people in to kind of get the chance to experience this. What, I mean, is there a timetable that you can share as far as when folks watching and listening might have the opportunity to drop in on an experience like this? Because now that I know what it's like, right. I, I mean, I've, I've been looking forward to this for a really Great. long time. So, right. you know, it's it's kind of like living a, 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 short, a dream that I've had for a little while now. I want to tell everybody about it and point them in the direction. Like, when sure. do people get the chance to do this? Um, so I can't get into specifics, as I'm sure you can understand. Yeah. Uh, I will say that 2018 will be a year when we will we will have real presence and people will really start to be able to try it. One of our missions as a company is we want to be in neighborhoods everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen in a year. That's going to take a while, but we have a plan to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be evasive, but from you know a guy who's been building games for a long, long time, uh, sometimes you know, release dates can always be a bit challenging and tricky. And now you've got something that has this whole new component where you know we've got a, a whole booth that we have to install you know, the internal part we have to set up and props that we're creating for these experiences. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of really cool stuff that we're working on, but it's all kind of got to dovetail at the right time. Hey, I'm here in Vallejo, California at Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. I'm about to hop on. As you can see here, Galactic Attack, it's a converted Kong roller coaster that brings a little Samsung Gear VR into the action. Mixed reality experience. Can't wait to check it out. Let's go do it. I don't know, am I tall enough for this ride? All right, looking forward to this. I think I've been skillfully just kind of like in denial in my head. And now I don't think I can do that anymore. <laughs> Can you let me know if you see the Six Flags logo with front, front, front around it? I see that, yep. I see everything around me with a bunch of kind of augmented stuff around it. All right. You're recording? Yeah. Oh, dear God. Bye-bye. See you in another world. Hmm. Um, all right, so I, I definitely feel like I'm actually not on a roller coaster, kind of. Really? I'm, well, I mean, looking around, like it's easy to trick my brain into thinking I'm just like watching a video. But Whoa, what's that? I don't know, but I'm a little scared about what that might mean. Uh, yep, we're in space. Okay. And we're about to die. Nice, get him, get him, get him! Wow, this is really weird. Are you shooting the things? I don't know what I got. I think so. Oh! 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 Man, I only just now realized that when I move around, you actually shoot. We survived. Hey, I'm standing here with Charles Loriano, uh, maintenance supervisor for one of the strangest 
mixed reality experiences I think I've ever had uh, <laughs> with the roller coaster here. Thanks for um, letting us kind of relive a childhood dream of having the, the theme park to ourselves today. You got it. I really appreciate it. It's a special experience, isn't it? <laughs> it's really super cool. So tell us a little bit about um, about the, the coaster that we have here that's been around since the 90s. It was Kong for a really long time. Is it right. still called Kong, even it, though the experience changes all the time? Yeah, it's still Kong. It's just with the New Revolution Galactic Attack VR experience. Which, I mean, you change these experiences, it sounds like, pretty regularly. Is the idea to kind of take old coasters and kind of make them fresh and new for, for people coming to the theme park? Right, it's a, great, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to use this technology to freshen up some of, some of our rides. Uh, and we're able to switch things up whenever we really want. Yeah. Um, so we ran Gargoyle Attack in October of last year and now we're running uh, the New Revolution Galactic Attack now. How do those two experiences differ? So anytime we do anything, we always try to upgrade, right? We use pass-through technology now, which we didn't have before with Gargoyles. Uh, and Galactic Attack, you know, you're able to sit down and it's mixed reality. You can see what's going on around you. Uh, and then when you, you saw when you got to the top of the lift, you, get, you punch through that wormhole uh -huh. and suddenly you're, you're in space and you're, you're fighting all these, uh, all the drones and the aliens. See, and I didn't even realize until the end of the first run through that I was participating. I wasn't just sitting there passively flying through space. I was actually fighting, you know, it, uh, right. it was actually a battle that ba based on where I was looking, I was shooting uh, shooting down ships and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we actually worked with VR coasters, we put Easter eggs in there, they, if you actually hit the drones, the different colored ones, there's a red one, a green one, and a blue one, if you hit them in a certain order, you can actually get an alternate ending at the end of the ride. Oh, no so, way! So you can literally ride it you know, a hundred times and get a different experience every time that you ride the ride. So you mentioned VR Coaster. VR Coaster is the company that you work hand in hand with to kind of sync up the ride itself with a virtual experience. Tell us a little bit about kind of uh, that process and, and, you know, acting, I don't know, as a, as a sort of liaison between them. So it's actually a really cool uh, process. We come in and we log the spline data of the ride. Uh, so we send around a phone with a program on it and we're able to see where the track is rising, dipping, turning, Twisting, inverting, all that kind of, yeah. right? So that we can build the virtual world around that spline data uh, okay. uh, and then match it once we're out here testing it out at the actual park. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so that means that you have to ride it like a hundred times uh, in order to get Sometimes, that, that right? Sometimes, yeah. So we actually start with a very basic layer in the virtual world. So like the first time I rode it, it was empty space almost. Right. And you were just flying around and then we would add a drone here and an alien there and a ship here until we ended up with the experience that you had today. I know the first time that I heard of we take a roller coaster and we mix it with virtual reality and like my immediate response was you, you don't need to do that it's a roller coaster roller coasters are crazy in and of themselves but then you you go through the experience and I mean it's it really is like entering a different world how has the public uh, how have they warmed up to it it's been great people love it uh, the galactic attack especially with the with the Easter eggs and the, the space theme is really excited I think with galactic attack uh, and it's already an exciting roller coaster, right? And adding the VR technology layer on top of that yeah. really steps it up and takes it up to the next level. <laughs> hey, it's really been fun visiting some of these great segments. This has been a great year for the new screensavers. We're so thankful to all of you who watch. Uh, of course, the team behind the scenes that makes the show possible. Uh, of course, Jerry Wagley and Anthony Nielsen, our producers, our studio manager, John Slanina, uh, Alex Gumpel, who keeps the, f the, the f TriCaster flowing. Who else should I mention? Have I gotten every, huh? Lisa. Oh, our executive producer and my lovely wife, Lisa Laporte. But really the most important part of this show is you, our viewers. We thank you so much for watching. If you haven't, tell your friends the Screensavers is back and better than ever. You can watch at twit.tv slash NSS anytime you want. Here's to a great 2018, and we promise you a lot more fun in the new Screensavers. Happy New Year, everybody. 